Your local writer's group is crap. Stop burning off your free time in the presence of introverted do-nothings. The Gosling's Writer's Group Podcast, a digital gang for writers. Writers who actually write stuff. Use typewriters. Who write all the people who've offended them into their stories, then murder the shit out of them. Writers who don't believe in dust jackets and name their pit bulls Hemingway. We're writers who lube their typewriters with gun oil because we're straight shooters. We don't always act pretentious, but when we do, we wear f***ing ascots. Welcome to The Goslings. Hello, everyone. And welcome. What's up, everyone? I'm Jonathan. I'm Nick. And we are The Goslings. And this is our weekly live stream that we do every mm-hmm. Sunday at 4.30 mm-hmm. Central Standard Time and uh, 4.30 p.m. 16.30 if you're on military time. Right, right. And uh, this is just like a writer's live stream, you know, a uh, creator's live stream yeah. or just a uh, digital in- writer's group. Yeah. Like a, kind of a yeah. hangout, weekly hangout. Yeah, it's digital until we can not be digital exactly. anymore. <laughs> exactly. I still have the dream of being the Hemingway you know, beach living, You'll get there. standing desk, typewriter, books, guns, bourbon, yep. and a dog. You yeah. Know? You'll get there. Yeah. That's, You'll that's the there. dream, baby. You name the dog Hemingway. Yeah. yeah. Got to name the dog yeah. Hemingway. Yeah. So anyways, well, we have an amazing uh, episode for you guys. Uh, yeah. We're going to be interviewing uh, and we'll bring him on here shortly. Richard Poult, yep. Dr. Richard Poult, uh, author of the typewriter revolution. I'm sure many of you guys know who he is already. If you yeah. know anything about typewriters, you've heard of, Richard Polt. Yeah. Uh, we're going to bring him on. Before we do, as always, we begin our writer's group sessions and podcasts and live streams with a toast. That's right. Yep. So we're going to do a special toast. And I think I went first last time. You sure? Uh-huh. Yeah. I believe so. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, well, what are we drinking? Well, for, uh, this is Bullet. We're drinking yep. Bullet. Uh, Bullet Rye. Bullet Rye. Mm, so Classic, good. a standard, almost a staple at this point for the Gosling live stream. It is for me. Yeah. It is for me, for sure. <laughs> Uh, you know, who knows how many empty bottles are in the yeah. trash can, you know, <laughs> empty tankards at this point. Uh, so, yeah, if uh, if you're new to the live stream, if you're joining us for the first time, uh, this is kind of liturgical. Uh, it's a two part thing. Yeah. I will say the first half and then everybody else will say the second half All and right. then we will uh, we will toast. So go for it. here we go. Yeah. Take up the broken sword of your father. Strike down the darkness. Amen. Cheers. Delicious as always. Yep. It's really funny. Nick was swapping out the battery and uh, and I started pouring. And then Nick started having this Pavlovian dry mouth. I did. I heard <laughs> the sound. He... I, my mouth went dry. I'm like, hmm, <laughs> is it time? <laughs> yeah. Pavlov's dog over here yeah. was, you know, yeah, it was pretty, it was pretty glorious. I've never seen that before. <laughs> I've been a long week for poor Nick. Yeah. So well, I've this been is a great been, way to end it. Absolutely. Yeah. I've been looking forward to meeting. Uh, yeah. Richard Polt for a long time. Yeah. Uh, so uh, without further ado, yes. we're going to bring on the man himself. Yeah. Very generous to give us his time. And we hope you guys enjoy this interview, ladies and gentlemen. Richard Polt. Dr. Richard Polt. Yeah. Dr. Polt, how you doing, sir? Hi, guys. I'm all right. Thanks for having me on. Good. Good. Cool. Man, we're super excited to have you. Um, uh, I think we first um, probably were exposed to you via California typewriter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's where, yes, that's where I first saw you, the California typewriter. Um, I can't remember which of the first four viewings of it, <laughs> but uh, I did watch it over and over again. I was fascinated with the documentary. Yeah. And uh, I was fascinated with the book as well. And uh, it was wonderful for you too. And we were looking for, we were looking for interview guests. Yeah. And I thought, man, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, just go out on a limb, take a, <laughs> get, take a shot and see if he'd, he'd like to come on and talk about it. Because we love typewriters so much. Yeah. Um, I would like to, if, if you wouldn't mind, uh, f- just a brief rundown of who is Richard Polt. Yeah. And why is he into typewriters so much? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm not going to tell you who I really am. But uh, uh, <laughs> so I'm a, I'm a philosophy professor. I, I teach at uh, Xavier University in, in Cincinnati. I've been here for long time so coming up on 30 years and um, I come from an academic background too my father was a professor of Spanish literature so I grew up with the sound of a typewriter Um, he was he was an academic writer 
uh, and they've always been part of my life. Um, here's one just a few feet away, well, one foot away. This is the machine my dad bought me when I was 12 years old at a yard sale. Uh, it's a 1937 Remington Noiseless Portable Number 7. Wow. Beautiful that thing. Beautiful. So yeah. I've been using that one for about 40 years. So, um, I, so I've loved them, you know, ever uh, as long as I can remember. Yeah. But um, I, I really went crazy, like in, I think it was 1994, I'd picked up a few random typewriters. I had like three or four 1930s portables like that one. But then I, I found this book that um, was called American Typewriters, A Collector's Encyclopedia by Paul Lipman. Mm -hmm. And um, he gets into all the bizarre early machines. Uh, and then I was just really fascinated. So yeah, ever since then, it's just it's been a, a hobby with many, many aspects. So uh, a hobby in um using them regularly for different things, actually doing a lot of work on typewriters, but also collecting them as well, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. Yeah, for for a while I wasn't using this one. So I used this one up until into grad, grad school. And then I got a Mac and this one went in the closet. And uh, But I started collecting in the 90s, as I said, and I was looking for the, you know, the weirder and the older, the better, and the, the rarer, the better. Mm -hmm. which is traditionally what, what typewriter collectors have been into, just you know, stuff yeah. that's hard to find and that blows your mind when you yeah. see it. Yeah. Uh, and I still really enjoy that. Uh, but then in the 21st century, I started using typewriters again a little bit more. And in 2010, I thought, well, I've been hearing about these people who are uh, blogging by typewriter. They call it typecasting sometimes. And, mm -hmm. and I thought, well, why not? I want to use these things and, and I'm going to try it. And that really opened the door to this whole world of contemporary typewriter culture, which was different from just collecting them and having them on a shelf. So, yeah. So, uh, wow. That led to the book. Awesome. awesome. Okay. See, that, that was going to be one of our questions. Yep, that answers yep. one of my questions yep. because it's one thing to, it's one thing to have something like that in your life. Like I've been using my grandmother's uh, Royal Quiet Deluxe for probably close to 20 years now, 15 to 20 years. Um, just as a fun exercise, a curio, you know, kind of thing. Uh, I've driven up until a couple of weeks ago, I've driven the same car for 20 years, but yeah. I've never written a book about my typewriter experience. I've never written a book about my Jeep, you know? So it's like one of the questions I was curious to ask you was like, what really kind of motivated you to formulate this? Because it, it seems like you have been on the ground floor of this typewriter insurgency that has been going on for a long time. And um, I don't know how much of that you've chronicled along the way or been a part of along the way or how much of that was revealed, especially in the first chapter with the typewriter insur insurgency, like on the back end through research. But uh, yeah. but yeah, it seems like, yeah. you know, something that was in the bones, but you actually like sat down and focused and made a book out of it, which is extremely rare. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, I, I, I wouldn't say I was in on the ground floor uh, of any of this, you know, like typewriter collecting has been around for a long time before me and, and people were doing creative stuff with typewriters before I really started to pay attention. But then I thought, uh, you know, this needs to be documented. There's so much going on. And, uh, and I was also getting more and more annoyed with computers and the way they were, <laughs> <laughs> every part of our lives and um that's when i came up with this uh, manifesto which which yes. then turned into the the book eventually yeah and i wanted to and i want to i'm going to ask you about the typewriter manifesto in a little while um yeah. one of the things that i definitely want to talk about is or ask you about is how surprised were you or at what moment did you see the typewriter as kind of a way to fight back yeah. against this increasingly invasive digital um, paradigm yeah the, the digital paradigm it's almost like there's this digital beast that is trying to consume mm -hmm. and devour every aspect of your life and there's yeah. a typewriter I mean, it's just it's a wonderful it's like break from that slithering leviathan yeah. you know and then yeah. there's the typewriter which is just mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I guess if I could reframe the question, at what point did you realize that there was kind of a revolt against that oh, by yeah. use of the typewriter? Was there a catalyst moment? 
Well, I guess it was, I don't know if there's a particular moment I can point to, but soon after I started that uh, blog in 2010, uh, I started to feel that because it felt uh, sort of oddly exciting and rebellious and, and dangerous, <laughs> even though nobody was reading the thing, to be, <laughs> to be uh, posting typewritten text on the internet. It just felt like such a contrarian thing to do that it, you know, it felt yeah. a little exciting. You can tell I, I don't have, live a very exciting life. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, it feels very like saboteur-esque, you yeah. know, against yeah. the internet, against, yeah, the, mm -hmm. the invasiveness. You're like, yeah, I'm going to use the internet to do something that is totally analog and beat the internet at its own game. They got to hate yeah, it, right? Exactly. They got to hate that you're writing something that they can't reach. <laughs> right. <laughs> of course, uh, now they can. I mean, <laughs> now you have to assume that anything typewritten that you put online is being automatically scanned. So if oh, you want to yeah. be uh, really secretive, put handwriting online. I think the, the computer is <laughs> yeah. really good at that. Well, yeah. I'd be in good shape. No one would be able to decipher <laughs> that. Say, yeah. yeah, we'd be fine, Richard. You know, we'd be absolutely yeah. fine. The mess well, uh, it speaks to that, too, because uh, and, and you can uh, confirm or deny this if you know, but I had always heard an apocryphal story for about 10 years now that in Russia, the KGB got around all of the spyware and the hacking and the, the digital cyber warfare that was going on internationally by reverting to typewriters. Have you ever heard of this before? Yeah, somewhere in the notes to my book that that's included. Um, I don't yeah. think it's apocryphal. It was a genuine news story. Now, of course, you know, they do lots of things digitally as we as we know right. all too well yeah. But, yeah. but but they did uh they are known to have bought you know a set of adler modern uh typewriters just for you know very secret documents uh where yeah. they don't want to have a copy and there's some other spy agencies and sensitive agencies that that have been reported as using typewriters That's that's where we get the uh, one of the main logos on Nick's T-shirt. We both we both have typewriter logos that we use for the mm -hmm. Goslings, but on Nick's it actually this, says this our first one. Yeah, you can't hack a typewriter. Hack a typewriter. And, yeah, it's yeah. it's it's basically true. And now somebody will point out that uh, the Soviets actually managed to hack our IBM Selectrics. I think it was in the seventies. Really? They it was very clever. You can read a document about this that's been declassified. They. They stuck a little magnetic sensor or something, you know, in the cord or something. And then they figured out that each position of this electric ball does create a slightly different magnetic flux. And that was broadcast to their their antennas or whatever. And so they were actually able to read what people in the U.S. Embassy were typing on their electric. Wow. Dude, so you, I might have to change this up. I might have to see. I mean, you can add a little asterisk on on your t-shirt yeah, <laughs> yeah we do asterisk. yeah yeah a little asterisk just manual, manual. Yeah. manual unless you're in the kgb in the 1970s you can't, <laughs> you can't no. i should tell you about my t-shirt too yeah. um look for it. It. Yeah. this is a K ky typer kentucky typer it's oh, cool. uh the business that my friend uh brian sherwood has in in lexington kentucky really um tell i've never heard of it tell us about it uh, well, he he does repairs and restoration. Uh, he's he's one of a new generation of typewriter repairmen. I was going to mm. ask you about that uh, because um, I recently had my typewriter repaired and restored by uh, Kirk with mm -hmm. Nashville Typewriter, and uh, I had mentioned um, that you were going to be a guest on our live stream. He wanted me to tell you hello, and he said that you were a phenomenal human being, a real gentleman, and uh, I just wanted to know if you had ever had. Any interactions with Kirk from Nashville Typewriter, or uh, have you guys have ever crossed paths? Yeah, we crossed paths two weeks ago. So there was a no kidding. There was that. a little uh, collectors meeting in Athens, Ohio, oh, and cool. uh, Kirk came up. We played uh, putt putt golf together, and um, <laughs> nice. that's awesome. Yeah, it was a good time. He's he's a great yeah. guy. Yeah, yeah, he was very sweet, and uh, he really he really took care of my typewriter, and he was. It's so cute because like he was uh, he was so generous. He offered to replace the case, the carrying case of the Quiet Deluxe, and uh, no charge. He was just going to give it to me, and I actually told him, "Is like, man, that's really sweet of you, but like this is highly sentimental because it belong. It was my grandmother's mm -hmm. when she was in high school, I think. Yeah. So can I actually have like the old case back? And he was, like, oh yeah, sure. No, I'm so sorry. You know, it's just yeah. He's like too good too sweet for his own good you know he was he was yeah. awesome and 
he brought my typewriter back to life. I mean, it had literally been 15 years since I had had any work done to it at all. There used to be some little copy place in Nashville, like off of Sitco Drive, that mm -hmm. would do it for you. And I think even that place has long since shuttered. So yeah. probably a lot like uh, Kentucky Typer, um, you know, he probably, I think Kirk kind of has the, the market cornered in Tennessee. Yeah, yeah. In, I don't Nashville, know. in the Nashville area, for sure. The middle Tennessee yeah. area, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. the only two people I knew of, there was a guy in Alabama, and then I think it may have been the Kentucky typewriter guy yeah. uh, who would work on it, but you'd have to send it off. You know, you'd have to mail it off. And I'm way too poor for that. So. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think that's interesting too. It's this, this revitalized interest in the typewriter in general among younger, I say younger people. Yeah. Younger than uh, us. Meaning people who didn't grow up with them. Yeah. yeah. And uh, in along with that, there is this explosion of interest in cr that, that creatives have in the typewriter for all of its various benefits. And we can talk about some of those. Yeah. But an interesting kind of result of all that is that you have, you know, the new generation of uh, repair people. Yeah. Typewriter repairmen and in typewriter restoration, this new generation of people who like to tinker. Yeah. Who love these old machines. Yeah. You know, um, I couldn't do it. <laughs> I've tinkered, but I, I couldn't do it because it yeah, is. That, I mean, that's, that's really encouraging. The The youngest uh, typewriter repairman I know right now is 15 years old. He lives in Florida and, cool. um, you know, he's quickly becoming a real pro. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's a new breed. It's really nice to see. They, they're kind of yeah. self-taught, but with the help of the Internet. So I guess yeah. the way you used to do it is you would be an apprentice. You'd work in an office machine shop. There'd probably be a whole squad of 10 people working in that shop um, often enough and, and you'd learn the business stage by stage and, um, and be initiated into it. But now it's, it's pretty hard to do that. But thank you, Internet. Um, and thank you, you know, YouTube and, and Facebook. Yeah. Uh, there are people who will help you. Yeah. Uh, well, so and you can teach typewriter yourself. revolution. I mean, a large portion of your book is dedicated towards, you know, sort of an introduction to maintenance troubleshooting mm -hmm. you know that's one of the i had no idea that that was in this i kind of just thought this was going to be a compendium or a history or a commentary but there's a lot of left brain information in here yeah. that's vital to new typewriter owners yeah. yeah it truly is a companion yeah a companion book thanks yeah it's it's just introductory what you get there on typewriter repair but just you know a few hints to get started yeah. thinking about things but there's as i said there are a lot of resources out there another a uh, thing I'll mention is um, what, well, Ted Monk, he's doing a lot. He runs the typewriter database, which is where you can date your typewriter based on serial number records, and you can upload pictures and uh, compare your machine to others of the same model and so on. And he also puts out a series of reprints of service manuals, which are you know, some, sometimes really rare uh, literature on how to fix a particular model of machine. So. Yeah. So that's all probably more readily available now than it was uh, back in the heyday. Uh, as long as you can go online, you can find those things. I actually, I, I visited his site. Uh, that's how I discovered that that was a 1948 Underwood. Mm. Uh, when I acquired it a few months ago, uh, I found the serial number and I just started, you know, scouring the internet to see if there was any way to look up a serial number on an old typewriter. And it took me to, to his site. Yeah. And uh, so I got to learn some things. <laughs> and once you know exactly which model you have and when it was built, then you can jump on YouTube. And, oh, sure. You know, you yeah. can learn a whole bunch of things about that specific uh, typewriter, which is really great. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what are um, what are some of your favorite? Per I know you, in the book you mentioned, I think it was in the book that you mentioned that you've used a typewriter for a variety of different things. What do you what of those of those uses? What do you enjoy doing the most with typewriters personally? Yeah. yeah. Well, personally, I haven't done it a lot, but but writing long fiction has been the most satisfying. Yeah. Um, so I have this novel, which I wrote in two months and 10 years. Uh, so the first draft was something yeah. I did uh, soon after starting my blog. Um, you've heard of National Novel Writing Month? Yeah, yes. NaNoWriMo. Because so, of your yeah. book, actually. Yep. Yeah, so, so NaNoWriMo, you try to write 50,000 words in 30 days in November. So um, once I was part of the Typosphere, I decided, okay, I'm going to try it again. I've tried writing a novel, and it never got beyond 20 pages, but um, I did it. 
now, 10 years later, I thought, well, maybe I'll write a sequel. And then I soon realized, um, oh, my first novel was really um, unfinished. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so it's really the second half of the, of the same novel. Uh, and now I'm trying to revise it and make it something that, that might be published worthy. But, but the fun was uh, just sitting at the typewriter and getting totally absorbed in that world of my own imagination without any distraction, without any spell check or easy edit. You know, you just yep. kind of keep plowing forward and yep. a lot of it is, is drivel, but you're, but it's going somewhere. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And that's, you know, I'm very, I'm a very, very new writer and uh, that's something that's been really, really hard for me and challenging mm -hmm. is to just get it out and get it on the page. Just try to tell the story and not stop and go back and fix all my not self edit many many uh, errors and mistakes <laughs> and the typewriter doesn't let you do that it just says nope yeah let's just keep going with it, it kind of pulls me along really yeah yeah uh, you know and it doesn't tell me what a horrible spiller i am or that <laughs> or that you're wrong in yeah. whatever choice you're making right uh, yeah right. yeah yeah i think that's that's what's brilliant about it as a tool and, and of course you know writing is a very individual thing so i would never say everybody should use a typewriter but but a lot of people get exactly what you were saying out of it. Yeah, it was interesting. I wasn't I, the first typewriter I had was a gift from Jonathan, my brother, uh, and it was. Oh, uh, that's right. I forgot about that. And it was the the same uh, model that he his grandmother gave him. He found one just like it on eBay and gave it to me as a gift, and that was my first typewriter. So and that was about what three years, two years ago. Two years ago, I think. Yeah. And uh, so I started, yeah. you know, playing around with it. So, yeah. This is. Why do I love this so much? Yeah, it was like a it was like a fish finding water. Yeah, I love old things. I love old things. <laughs> yeah, he and built was, a sailboat one time. It was pretty cool. <laughs> I did. You know. But I was and I like I like mechanical things. I mean, that's all great, but when I it was like the experience was almost like the the whole point. Yeah. Yeah. In a way. And I think yeah. you mentioned that in one of your blog articles. You said something about like the mean using a typewriter is more than a means to an end, but it's the end itself. Yeah. Were you talking, what were you, was that the experience you were talking about or is it something more than that? Um, yeah, the experience, the creativity, um, you know, it, it just is an enjoyable activity in itself. Uh, like, you know, now I am trying to revise that, that novel. I've, I've rewritten it on a word processor. I'm fiddling around with it. All the great things that, that computers can do, and, I, and I'm grateful for them. But even if I'd never done that, and I, you know, it never turned into anything else, it was just a, a really great experience. So, yeah, um, and it's enjoyable. So we need things like that. Well, it changes. At least we've experienced it. You know, I've experienced it for 15 years. Nick, for the past couple of years, yeah. it changes your voice uh, mm -hmm. in a lot of ways because you can't really go back and self-edit. You can't really go back and you know switch things around or in any mistakes that you have you know are more or less there and um so you just kind of have to it's like the train moves forward you just better keep laying track yeah you know <laughs> and uh yeah. but it does have a way of of making you focus i mean the interesting thing is or one of the interesting things to me is that you grew up before computers were common household items um, I was, I think, 10 years old when PCs, you know, Packard Bell and IBM and, you know, Apple and yeah. iMac and all that really came into vogue. Uh, Nick's a little older than me. Um, so all three of us have experience of life before computers. But it's so interesting watching the younger generation who has grown up with iPhones, you know, mm. who has grown up with PCs and Netflix and all of this stuff and Xbox revert back because it is just a, a siphoning of your of your soul almost and a spreading too thin of your of your energy over this digital domain and the typewriter has a way of just like nick says like just sort of mm. pulling you in and having you just sit down and focus mm -hmm. you know and and it creates a whole different experience um that everybody seems to gravitate towards yeah but yeah yeah, yeah it's not something that it you know i think and maybe maybe this is in your book too, but it's a beautiful analogy where the typewriter is to the computer what you know the sailboat basically is to yeah. a motorboat now. Yeah. And forgive me, that was probably an awful 
uh, rephrasing. <laughs> I think uh, but somebody else has credit for that one, but uh, what you what enough. was so popular and it well it was created to be it, it was at the time yeah it was this peak efficiency machine yeah cutting edge you know and it allowed us to do this thing and it was for work nobody you know back in the 1800s went sailing for pleasure you know <laughs> right, yeah. it was the only way to get around <laughs> yeah you know uh and the typewriter was the best way to get things printed yeah but now it's it it almost vanished into obscurity and now it's like we go back to these things for the experience of it yeah. now sailing is something you do just for pleasure <laughs> right yeah you know yeah uh and uh and no one's out there home. harpooning whales yeah you know you know yeah. yeah yeah i have a question for you uh do you have how two questions how big is your typewriter collection <laughs> <laughs> well it's it's about 200 um oh, at its peak it was more like 300 so i'm trying to get it down uh, on the other hand, there are a lot of parts machines and things that aren't technically in my collection, but they're sitting in my house, so they might as well be. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. The thing is, I, I started doing some typewriter repair myself uh, to raise funds for a local nonprofit that uh, works with, with kids doing creative writing and uh, cool. you know, poetry slams and stuff like that. Yeah. What's so, the name of it? Uh, Wordplay Cincy. Wordplay Cincy. That, Wordplay mm -hmm. Cincy is actually in the book. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. That was, yeah, that was just, a great thing. They've just moved into a nice big uh, building in Cincinnati and uh, they're renovating it. There's going to be a huge mural, including a typewriter. Um, oh, cool. But so this is my, my little uh, side business, or it was until we got a new puppy and I, I don't have time for it anymore. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, what they, about right. that's what they do. <laughs> yeah. The yeah. puppy will, will hopefully turn into a dog and, and calm down a little bit. But uh, <laughs> what kind of puppy? A border collie. Oh, cute! Oh man, yeah. 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 She's super cute, super smart, great dog. Uh -huh. Yeah, you know those are good dogs to have too because they keep you active. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they don't give you a choice. No, yeah, like I mean, if you you can't treat a border collie like uh, like you can a basset hound, a border collie high energy, you know, like it. A border collie will make you go hiking. Yeah. A border collie will make you go to the park or, you know, go to the beach or whatever. But fortunately, they also have high intelligence. Yeah, yeah. yeah nothing absolutely. worse than a high energy yeah. dog that's like dumb. Yeah, <laughs> down here on the sea slug level. <laughs> that's not yeah. that's no good. Yeah, um, exactly. Well, Smart and active. So, so, but before we got the, the puppy, I was getting you know, typically one or two typewriter jobs a week. And that's I something know. I can do in my spare time, you know, after dinner, sitting in the man cave downstairs. Um, mm -hmm. But then I, I would pick up all these thrift store junky typewriters because you need them for parts. And so they're kind of cluttering up the house right now. So, okay. so the real answer to how many typewriters I have is probably over 300. Wow. That's awesome. I think that's, I think that's my wife's fear yeah. is that I'm going to start cluttering the house with typewriters. I have five. Oh, so that's I only have five. Nothing. It's a baby collection <laughs> and I have a sixth on the way. Yeah, You're talking yeah. like it's a child. Well, yeah, yeah. You know? This is we're talking like yeah. kid terminology. Here. And already you I'm know. getting the. So are you going to get rid of one? <laughs> <laughs> you know. But let me yeah. ask you this: um, with that's a, that's a huge collection, like two hundred yeah. plus typewriters. That's awesome. And I know you yeah. probably. I would say many of them are very functional, and you probably use many, many of them. Do you find or feel that your writing voice or style ever changes? depending on which typewriter you're using? Yeah. That's a good question. I think it'd be really cool if it did, but, but the answer is probably no. Um, really? Okay. I mean, it, I have a lot of really weird, you know, early typewriters, but if, if they're really weird, I, I don't use them. Like if they don't have a QWERTY keyboard or they only have two rows of keys or they, or they don't have any keys at all, they have an index that you select the letter. You know, there's so many different fascinating systems, but I can't actually write on that and um and if there is something with you know a keyboard that i know how to use i, yeah. I think my voice is is pretty much the same um, okay that's good, that's good. Yeah. i think my, mine changes wildly oh yeah because i can't rein it in <laughs> probably because i can't rein it in <laughs> you know, you know it, well it takes time too you know what's the uh what's the strangest typewriter you have oh oh man um the strangest. Well, there's a Shoals Visible. It's hard to even describe it. 
it's like the type bars are in two columns in, in front of the thing, and then they go pop, 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 pop. Oh, um, weird. Let's see if I have something really weird in this room. <laughs> I can show you around. I mean, th this is my cluttering. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. This is my my home office. Let's see. Awesome. Here's a Voss. This is a very beautiful machine. Oh, wow. That is beautiful, yeah. Um, one of the best machines for actual writing is this uh, Olympia SG-1. Olympia SG-1. Yeah, this is like one of the very best. Um, it almost feels like an electric typewriter. It's so smooth and so fast. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, here's a, another fantastic machine, an Adler Standard from 1938. This oh, has yeah. one, of the, one of the best touches I've ever tried. Sounds so good. That sounds weird. Women really knew how to make typewriters. Um, I'm sure you've seen an Oliver before. Yeah, there you have a. Uh, I've seen that on your website actually. Uh, yeah, that the one on my website I, I just actually sold to my friend Mitch in the suburbs. <laughs> Start <laughs> starting to to get rid of these machines, but this is number eleven. I think this might be the weirdest one in the room, even though it's a common machine. Um, if you're not familiar with these, it's really strange. So it's got only three banks of keys. It's got two shift keys like the Corona you've got there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then the uh, the type bars are not straight, but they're sort of U-shaped and they come down onto the paper. Oh, that is interesting. So they come up to the paper that you actually slam down. Yeah. Okay. So let's see. I don't have anything particularly bizarre uh, in the room. But What was the name of that last one again? Uh, Oliver? The Oliver? Yeah. The Oliver. Interesting. Um, okay, so the hammers come down. Uh, do you? Is that something that uh, increases the maintenance on it, or like the weirder you get, you know, when you're using stuff that's non-standard like that? Do you do you use it enough to? I mean, maybe you haven't used these enough to ever encounter these problems, but do you find like, oh, there's a reason why they don't do them like this, you know, or there's a reason why they stopped. Well, the Oliver, um, I, I can't type much on it. It just feels too weird. Like the, the really? position of the keys is a little different, so I always hit the wrong one. There's a double shift. I don't even like using little Corona because of that. I don't even like yeah. using my, my phone keyboard, which also has a double shift, right? It only has three, uh -huh. three rows, and then you have to shift to get a comma, which drives me crazy. Oh, I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, the only reason I think Nick and I both, I don't know if it's the same way for you, but the only reason that we even have smartphones is just to do social media marketing. Yeah. I think if we as, as you know, um, novelists, in, independent novelists, uh, if we had a marketing team or if we didn't care about that anymore, yeah. the cell phones that, or at least the smartphones would be out of our lives and we would have flip phones at absolutely best, absolutely you know? i got mine running somewhere yeah. well i would i would miss the maps you know because because the thing the idea that this device can give you uh step by step you know turn at the next light directions is is pretty amazing i gotta say <laughs> it is i appreciate your honesty well you know what it's i'm so grateful to hear dr Polt say that because when uh when i nick um i may have been on the typewriter game long before Nick, but Nick got on the flip phone game before me. Mm. And when I went to a flip phone, I remember like literally you remember the only thing that I missed was like not having Google Maps available right. at any given time. Right. You know? And it, it turns out like twenty dollars on Facebook Marketplace can get you like a little Garmin GPS, you yeah. know, yeah. which yeah. sucks. Yeah. But uh but yeah, like that is really like when you boil it down, it's the only thing that people will really miss because that's the only thing that you can't just easily replace. Yeah. You, know? well, you, you can always go old school like we used to and get printed maps. You know, there are yeah. great atlases out there. And, and when uh -huh. you get lost, you pull over. You don't drive looking at the atlas, but you pull over. <laughs> you plot. You, but, and, and I guess the advantage there is that there isn't some who knows what tracking your every location. Um, yep. But, yeah, I, I'm willing to make some sacrifices, you know. Um, I feel I am a, a bit of a hypocrite because it, with everything I said against digital devices, you know, this thing is almost always with me. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Incredibly yeah. useful. Yeah. It's so hard to get it out of your life, you know? 
I think that this is a very perfect yet rough time to transition to the typewriter <laughs> manifesto. Okay. <laughs> Can we get him to read it? Uh, I, yeah, I don't. Would you mind? Uh, would you mind reading the typewriter manifesto? Okay. We well, it. ironically, I will. I will pull it up on my smartphone. <laughs> <laughs> there perfect. we go. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> and uh, it. it before you do, if you wouldn't mind just telling people what is the typewriter manifesto and what prompted you to write this? Yeah, yeah. This was, I think, um, 2012. So I'd been doing my blog for a couple of years and just this this feeling of rebellion had been uh, building up. <laughs> and uh, I went to the gym one morning and this, these like slogans started you know, rolling through my head as I was working out. And I thought, hey, this is amusing. And this is also kind of stirring and exciting and I'm going to type this up when I get to the office. And so, so I did, um, then I posted it on a website and just, I put a link to it on my blog and, um, it was actually a, a typewritten link. So it was not a live link. People had to actually type it in. So it was kind of a, a secret. <laughs> I love it. That's awesome. Uh, and then people loved it. And, uh, I thought, you know, this, this really could be, uh, the, uh, the kind of conceit for a book. So, yeah, you can find it on my website, typewriterrevolution.com. Perfect. Here it is. Uh, <laughs> we assert our right to resist the paradigm, to rebel against the information regime, to escape the data stream. We strike a blow for self-reliance, privacy and coherence against dependency, surveillance, and disintegration. We affirm the written word and written thought against multimedia, multitasking in the meme. We choose the real over representation, the physical over the digital, the durable over the unsustainable, the self-sufficient over the efficient. The revolution will be typewritten. <laughs> it's the most metal thing anybody has yeah. ever written about a typewriter. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. Amen, Dr. Bolt. Yeah, and it is very rebellious. And um, the, you know, the revolution will be typewritten. The, the Boston Typewriter Orchestra gets credit for that. They have a that's uh, I think that's the title of one of their songs. So. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, cool. Uh, the um, the masters in philosophy is yeah definitely understandable. Yeah, you I were know. the you were the person yeah. to start this charge for sure. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, the uh, the Socrates of the of the digital <laughs> <laughs> rebellion against the digital paradigm. You know. So let me. Uh, I have a question for you. So resisting the digital paradigm, meaning the the insistency that we have to digitize every part of our life yeah. and consolidate it down to a device that ultimately we can't control. Yeah. How do we apply that same manifesto, the philosophy behind it? How do we apply it to other areas of our lives where technology seems increasingly invasive, like cars, phones, toys, you know, so forth? Yeah, great, great question. Um, and you're right about what I mean. I mean, you know, the, the simple interpretation of that manifesto is let's throw away our phones and computers. And But, but it, it's a little more subtle than that, as I try to explain in the book, right? I mean, here we are, the internet is bringing us together, and it's a great yep. thing. Sure. Uh, it's just, as you say, we want to resist the tendency to, to let this totally absorb our lives and to assume that everything can and should be digitized, because because yeah. there are there are negatives that we're aware of. There's the loss of privacy, the loss of concentration, mm -hmm. um, the the scatterbrained uh, mentality that takes over you. The myth of multitasking. Mm -hmm. you, know? Yeah. you know, you can't really multitask if the task is at all demanding and interesting. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, and you know, I witnessed that in. Uh, I had a corporate. Uh, dispatch job for a little while and uh, for a year and a half. And that was a big thing that they always promoted. And you spent nine hours a day on a computer just doing all these different things. And they would always talk like multitasking was this, this thing that you should do. And here are these exercises, you know, and games you can play to increase. But the truth is, just like you say, if it's demanding or if it's interesting, it's going to suck you in yeah. and you can't write an email while you're doing this thing, you know? And, and if, even if you somehow manage to, the results are going to be, it's a hundred percent of a pie that's spread 
15 percent yeah. here 20 percent there 30 percent there yeah. and all of it sucks yeah <laughs> that's right you know? yeah so and, and none that's, of its quality that's the beauty of uh I, I think your message and the typewriter as kind of an apotheosis of like mm. technology and humanity in this very frank herbert dune ian sort of way mm -hmm. of like here's something that won't suck your soul out but here's something that you have to invest in to make work and you have to concentrate and focus on it. And as one of like, I was diagnosed with ADHD in 1990 when I was seven years old. Uh, I went to a special school for it. I mean, I will tell you like anything, computer or phone will just destroy your ability to focus. The typewriter almost seems like an answer to a neurological behavioral plague, mm -hmm. you know, that mm -hmm. has seemed to have risen along the same time as the digital age. Yeah. Yeah. You actually, Dr. Polk, in, in, Polk, in your uh, book, you, you said that there were, well, there was a number of examples with kids that had ADHD and oh, they yeah. were really thriving. Yeah. Uh, you know, by using yeah. typewriters to do their schoolwork. Why do you think that is? Yeah. Anecdotally, that, that seems to be true. And I think, um, you know, it's probably more than just a correlation that that the rise of digital technology coincides with the rise of so many ADHD diagnoses because yeah. this stuff is scattering our attention. Um, so I just think it exacerbates these problems. Uh, and yeah, I've heard about a number of kids who they have various sorts of you know disabilities or they just they think differently or they're they're hyper in some way. But you give them a typewriter and they will just be riveted to it and they'll sit there for hours and they'll write a long story or a letter to somebody. Um, so it's kind of a, a magical thing. You give them something that does only one thing and then they get really interested in doing that one thing. Yeah. I've noticed that because my, my kids are, uh, I have two kids, 12 and nine, and uh, their friends often come up. We have homeschool, so we have lots of groups of kids come to our house all the time to do stuff. And every once in a while, they'll want, this is actually my garage. They'll wander in here and they'll see my tire. I usually keep them up there on the bar and uh, uh they'll wander in here and they'll see the typewriters and every time it's <laughs> their hands go straight to it the questions start pouring out what is this or oh my gosh is that a typewriter or i've never seen one in person before and yeah. they start asking how does it work and yeah. you know and uh and it's so interesting to me that you know they're they're fascinated by it like they yeah. can't they can't not give it their attention. I think you had mentioned something about that in chapter one about like yeah. in the pawn shop or something. And every time kids would go to it and you'll instantly hear the I clacking, love that. you know, I love that. Why? What is it about the typewriter that and, and, and even adults are like this too. Yeah. But what is it about the typewriter that you think makes kids so fascinated by it? In an age where they have, you know, the internet and video games provides them endless entertainment. Yeah, well, I guess the a superficial answer would be just that it's different, right? So when when I was a kid, something like this would have been just incredibly magical. Oh my God, I have a TV in my pocket. And, uh, <laughs> look, it has these wonderful little floating images, and you can touch it, and it responds, and it connects you to the world. And wow, you know, um, and I still think it's pretty cool. Yeah. But now the kids have have grown up with it, and they're they're like, oh yeah, you know, it's a screen, but this is different. This actually stuff moves when you use your muscles. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, but I don't think that's the whole answer that is different because, you know, I grew up in this pre personal computer age and I was always fascinated by the typewriter. Yeah. Um, just the way some people are fascinated by a piano or other musical instruments because um, it's, a, it's a finite thing that has infinite possibilities. And if you yeah. just become skilled at it, you can create more and more and more and spend the rest of your life creating new stuff from this maybe very old thing. So I, that could be said of a, of a lot of tools, but I think it's yeah. maybe especially true of a typewriter. It's um, a great so observation. Kids kind of feel that. They kind of sense that. Well, I love that because you're right. I mean, electronic technology and digital technology hasn't taken away the love of instruments. Right. You know, we still play trumpets. We yeah. still play cello, pianos. pianos. Yeah. Yeah. 
yeah, yeah this still hasn't gone and away there's still and people you know mastering the classical guitar even though there are yeah. tons of fuzz pedals and you yeah. know uh, and programs out there to mm -hmm. you know yeah make your guitar sound like cthulhu you know? <laughs> <So>. <laughs> And then there, there are people who are into traditional sound recording and reproduction, of course. I mean, vinyl is a big thing. People who are into traditional uh, photography. Um, yeah. So there, there are many opportunities for us to just find little alternatives to the digital paradigm when, we, when we're on the lookout for them. For, for me, a bike is an important thing. Yeah. Um, that's kind yeah. of what kept me from going totally insane during lockdown is... is getting out on a bicycle every day, yeah. um, which is another just mechanically built machine that connects to your body and gets you somewhere and yeah. Um, yeah. lets you forget about the internet for a while. And yeah. requires something of you. The Border Collie is going to love that, by the way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Good point. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you know, you mentioned photography um, around the same time that I was uh, really falling in love with a typewriter, like 2005, 2007. I also got a Nikon F2, Potomac, oh. um, <laughs> sorry, uh, manual 35 millimeter SLR, you know, mm -hmm. in an age where the iPhone had just come out. And just like you say, like, you know, there's almost this gravitation of like uh, a self-actualizing, uh, not m maybe like a Luddite, you know, but just a, a self-actualizing spirit that just says, you know, like you get on the bike, you could buy a motorcycle, you know, but a bike almost asks something of you in order to mm -hmm. make it work. Just like a typewriter asks something of you, demands something of you. And it demands you in like a very Stephen Pressfieldian sort of way, overcome resistance and show up, mm -hmm. you know, and, and you, you know, you become the, the energy behind the machine not just the creativity, unlike a digital device, so much of our digital devices just almost want you to be this Wally -E kind of floating passive yeah. sort of. It doesn't require any participation know. in the actual experience. Yeah, or any like assertion. Does. You know, yeah. I don't know. Do you, do you feel that way? Uh, yeah, that's beautifully stated. And, and, you know, these things make us interact with the physical world, which I still think is more real than the digital world. Yeah, yeah, it really is. Yeah, for yeah. sure. How do you feel like technology has robbed creatives? Well, you know, first of all, I, I actually object to using the word technology to refer only to digital electronic technology. Uh, so I'm it. not a Luddite. Typewriters are technology, right? Yeah, they true, are, true. They're the cutting edge of 19th century technology. <laughs> um, so they're, they're a very modern, uh, very complicated uh, device. And uh, I, I just think some some types of technology are better than others, uh, more yeah. appropriate to, to your particular needs. Okay. Do you think the pendulum has swung so far out into this uh, this digital age that there is a thirst for that mechanical kind of um, self actualizing thing that's bringing it back? Because I know that you had mentioned like the hipster movement, you know, kind of, there was a cross pollination between, uh, but you know what? I've known a lot of hipsters, none of them own typewriters, but they all, and there were some friends of mine, they all were in love with, uh, with old records mm -hmm. because they, and our father who was a record producer for 50 years said the same thing that analog records sound warmer and richer than anything digital had created, hmm. you know? So, uh, you know, there is this this crossover. But do you think like the pendulum has swung so far that we're starting to kind of pull that back? Or is this something that's always been there as a philosophy? Um, um, my guess is that no, the pendulum, there is no pendulum. There is no pendulum. <laughs> Interesting. So okay. I, I was originally going to call the book The Typewriter Insurgency because insurgency is like a small minority guerrilla movement against a dominant regime and it's maybe never going to win right all right revolution yeah. so my, my publisher rejected the word insurgency because it has you know negative connotations from iraq but sure um, all right you know i could i could see that so i said okay well fine uh revolution but i don't i don't really love <laughs> that title because it suggests the typewriters are going to take over somehow which is 
not true unless civilization <laughs> collapses, right? So right. more likely yeah. is we ain't seeing nothing yet, right? We feel, we feel like our lives are totally dominated by uh, digital devices, but no, there's yeah. going to be quantum computing everywhere. There's going to be the Internet of Things everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there, and there is no limit, literally, because, uh, you know, Google has said we want to, what, what is it? We want to organize the world's information or something. Well, what is the world's information? Okay, yeah. there's information about every atom of every object in the world. Mm -hmm. So there is no limit. I mean, the limit of the world's information is the limit of the universe. Mm -hmm. And yeah. as we build still faster, tinier, cheaper devices that can do more and more and more, you know, they will continue to proliferate. Yeah. Uh, with yeah. incalculable, incalculable and, and pretty disturbing consequences. Yeah. But... Yeah. There's going to be this insurgency because there will always be some people, I think, who are who are bothered by this and don't want it to take over everything. So yeah. that's why I think uh, typewriters are not just a hipster thing or a fad, yeah. but but paradoxically, the more computer the more computing advances, the more we're going to need stuff like typewriters. Yeah. Well, there's a real legacy aspect to it, you know. Of uh, like we're we're big on legacy, which you can kind of tell by like our toast, you know. Yep. And, Yep. And typewriters, uh, you talk about it in the book, um, you know, typewriters are multi-generational machines that require, when you really think about it, minimal maintenance yeah. to survive. You know, like I paid $60 for a World War II era field desk typewriter, you know, that like with, with a couple of exceptions still works yeah. like it did 70 years ago, mm -hmm. you know. And so there is this beautiful through line of, of humanity with mm. that's i think maybe representative of the typewriter and exists in the typewriter for people you know and mm. I, so i don't know I, yeah i think you're right there's always going to be an insurgency there's mm. always going to be like people who who understand or who feel drawn to it mm. you know and thank god for it you know it's yeah. awesome these things were made to last and uh you can learn to fix them you know just using your naked eye and, and intelligence and a little <laughs> Uh, so I think that the really great typewriters will still be around for another century before they break down and hopefully yeah. somebody will start building good ones again. Yeah, so mm. you probably know people are still making manual typewriters. There is one little factory in Shanghai that makes them. Uh, but, really? Yeah, but they're really terrible. So, uh -huh. <laughs> you know, uh, that's the next step in the insurgency, I bet, is the manufacturing of because we're already at the renovation and repair and maintenance stage. And as more people watch the documentary, read your book, find out about you, you know, and, and or just buy typewriters on their own, I mean, it will metastasize in a good way. Yeah. You know, it, it really will spread, not just as a rejection of digital technology and as a subversive renegade, you know, movement, you know, of, mm. of uh, hapless rebels, but, but also- Which is good uh, too. Which is sexy. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but like, but really just, I think people will just gravitate towards it on their own. Like when I got into, when I had G Mama's typewriter, at, yeah. you know, in 2004, 2005, there was no rebellious, subversive nature to it. It was just something cool. Mm -hmm. And that will always exist. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it's never going away, mm -hmm. even when the grid goes down. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> when the grid goes down, uh, we'll still be able to write novels. Yeah. yeah. Actually, a good uh, segue for me to mention. Uh, the project I've had after the typewriter revolution, which is a series of, of books. Maybe you've seen them. Uh, the series is called Cold Hard Type. And uh, it's uh, anthologies that I've edited uh, with my friends, uh, Fred Durbin and Andrew McFeeters. Uh, and what it is, is it's mostly stories. They're all written by typewriter and they're published as images of typewriting. There is no digital text in this That's book. Cool. There's also poetry and photos. Um, and each volume has a theme. So this one, Paradigm Shifts, is uh, imagine the digital civilization did collapse and people are using typewriters. Tell stories about that world. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> okay. How many uh, of those have you guys done? Uh, four so far. For, so this was, um, when did this come out? 2019. Uh, and we got so many good submissions, we... We published two volumes that year. The second one was called Escapements. 
uh, sort of post-apocalyptic typewriter stories. Uh, 2020, we did a collection of time travel stories, time travel into the heyday of typewriters. Um, so the, I've always been fascinated by time travel stories. Yeah. yeah. And then for this year, we did a collection of horror stuff. This is called Dead Keys. It's a little bit hard to read. Oh, awesome. There's an Oliver on, on the cover. Okay. Oh, there yeah. it is. Yeah. yeah. I think so, it's got like, um, a very feline profile to it. Yeah. Yeah. These, these are fun, I think. You can find them on Amazon uh, and okay. only on Amazon. <laughs> uh, okay. I kind of need Amazon, but they do a great job of of um you know print on demand for very yeah. little so we make no profit from this so you can you can buy it at cost which is like seven dollars per volume. oh wow yeah that's, that's very generous of that's you. Fantastic. uh does the countryman press uh make that one as well or did you guys uh no this is i self-published these i started a yeah. little publishing company called loose dog press uh oh, it's cool. actually a, a technical pun because a loose dog is part of a typewriter's mechanism Oh, really? <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, I love it. Dude, I'm going to have to get those. Those are yep. so cool. Nick and I, um, we do uh, every week when we do the live stream, we do a typewriter one-off mm. where we read like a single page typewriter yeah. uh, story. Just a single page story, sometimes two pages in my case. Well, yeah, I'm we're a writer's group, but you can't come to a writer's group without, and be a part of it without actually bringing something you've written. Yeah. So we do it every week and we do it on a typewriter. But it's funny to see page. that like, you guys have, have beat because we've talked about doing that or like we would we talked about taking after like maybe a year taking all of our one-offs and scanning them and then publishing them uh, you know as like a volume a compendium yeah, a little one-page short story yeah and then Where's letting people writers? like you know create their own you know spin-offs of that or something but yeah. so that's but you guys have like actually done yeah, they've actually done the thing that we've been talking about doing that's so cool. yeah well you guys should contribute to the next volume we haven't decided what the theme will be for next year but but okay. we'll be announcing it in a couple months probably uh we'll and if anybody else wants to check it out there's there's a there's a blog uh blog site loose dog press dot blogspot dot com uh which has information about um, okay about I have, I have a question from uh, someone who's watching from Canada. I believe it's Atelier. If I, I might be saying Atelier. that. I might be saying that totally wrong. Uh, and the uh, question is: that. Are all the books available outside of the U.S.? Yeah. Yes. Um, so, again, uh, go to Amazon.ca and you can uh, buy them. You know, from the Canadian distributor. Yeah. Okay. Very oh, good. His name is Daniel. I see it at the end of the. See his first. Yeah. Message up there. Yeah. 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 Good yeah. question, Daniel. Oh, thanks, Daniel. Yeah. It should be no problem. Oh, yeah. I missed it, Daniel. Okay. Very good. Um, yeah, man, that is such a cool idea, and I'm so glad that like somebody has actually, you know, but you guys have done four yeah, volumes of that. Us. Yeah. It's it's been fun. You know, it's kept us out of trouble. Um, the main <laughs> the main point is just to get people to use their typewriters, inspire them to to create yeah. stuff. But I think the results have really been good. We got lots of submissions and and uh, we, we were able to select some some really good stuff. Yeah. yeah. Well, I know we're kind of straight on time. We're coming up on an hour, no. but yeah. I do have one last question sure. for you and, and you might have one too. Um, how do we, what are some things we can do to advocate for the typewriter? The typewriter and using the typewriter for creativity. Yeah. Besides buy your book, which we've already done. Yeah. And everyone else should do too. Yeah, because it's a beautiful book. Thank you. Um well just just uh I guess expose friends to typewriters either either online or in the physical world. And I think they're gonna to appeal to a significant minority of people. <laughs> uh they're not for everybody, and that's fine. But I would say there's a good solid one percent of humanity that could benefit from a typewriter and that's a lot of <laughs> yeah. people actually and uh, yeah. so so I've been at this for a while and it's it seems like everybody should know that typewriters are a thing but in fact most people have no clue about this subculture they don't know that it exists so um, get out there and, and see if you capture people's imagination and one thing you can do or anybody can do is host a type in so yes, type we were in. talking about that earlier yeah, yeah. I mean yeah. It, all it is is at least two people 
who love typewriters who get together in a public place and they bring their typewriters and they have fun. You know, they you can do whatever you want. You can talk, you can try out each other's machines, maybe you can buy and sell, maybe you could have a, a speed contest or you know, just goof off. Uh, yeah. And uh, you might be surprised by how many people in your area want to do this once they get yeah. wind of it. And uh, you do it in a public place and other people will come up and say, oh my God, I haven't seen one of those for so many years. That's so cool. I want to get yeah. one. And so um, it keeps spreading. And uh, I can see that in the sales of my book, which are, you know, it's not a bestseller by any stretch of the imagination, but it kind of it trickles along. It doesn't go down to zero. And so every week, um, a few people are, are buying this book. And it's very satisfying to think that, yeah, I'm, I'm contributing to yeah. making the world a little bit better, you know, one yeah. typist at a time. That light stays alive, baby. Mm -hmm. yeah. It may flicker every now and then, but the candle is still there. Well, we got to think yeah. about doing that. Maybe we should host to. a type in. Yeah, we were talking about it earlier. Yeah, in town. That'd be neat. Doing a local, yeah. Yeah, yeah we never... Bit. Whenever I publicize them, somebody comments, uh, man, I wish people would do something like that in my town. And I always say, do, do it. <laughs> yeah, you do yeah, it. Just yeah. do it. You yeah, do it. absolutely. It doesn't take anything. Yeah. Uh, and, but, you know, I have, uh, I guess my biggest social media account has become Instagram, which I, I, I enjoy. It's kind of a nice feeling there. Yeah. Um, so if anybody does put together a type in, they can contact me and send me a graphic or whatever and and I can help to spread the word. You might so, be hearing yeah. from us pretty soon. Doc. Yeah, right. I'm just yeah. going to let you know. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Give me a heads up. Well, um, man, this has been awesome. Yeah. Thank you. It's been a real treat. Thank it you. It really has. And, you. And we appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. And uh, this is an absolutely beautiful book. Uh, this is worth every bit of what you pay for it. The binding is beautiful. The Countryman Press did a great job of this. Um, the ribbon is really cool. The little, uh, yeah. little black and red ribbon that comes ribbon. on it. And the, I mean, the production value on this book is through the roof. This is a lot of book for the money. I'll be really honest. Yeah, with that's you. true. I was, uh, I was really surprised at the quality of this and, um, not just a, a good compendium of, uh, you know, the history of typewriters, yeah. uh, the typewriter insurgency, but also a, a good primer for a how to and troubleshooting, yeah. you know, Anybody who's interested in the typewriter, because a lot of people can get typewriters and then be intimidated. Sure. You know, but like having this is a great companion for any new typewriter owner or someone who just might think they want to try it out. Yep. You know, or find one in their grandmother's closet or something. Mm -hmm. So um, where else can people find you, Dr. Polt? Uh, so since 1995, I've have, had a website called the Classic Typewriter Page. Yeah. Um, and it's not updated very often, but it has a lot of resources there, like um, user's manuals or um, a list of, you know, which typewriters were used by which writer, that kind of thing. Oh, that's cool. Um, yeah, that is cool. And then I'm on Instagram at Typewriter Revolution and Facebook, the Typewriter Revolution. Yeah. Awesome. No Twitter? No Twitter. I tried it and it's just so nasty and you know, you, you can't Agreed. tell whether these accounts are bots or, or what. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I did not like you, bud. Yep. We couldn't do it either. Yeah. <laughs> so, that's awesome. Go ahead. Well, uh, Dr. Polt, it's been a lot of fun yeah. and we really appreciate your time. Thank you for doing this yeah. and thank you for the amazing book. Yes. Um, we're going to continue going back to that over and over. It's, it is such a great companion Yeah. and, uh, we'll stay in touch. And of course, you know, we're, we're active on, uh, Instagram as well, so we'll stay in touch with you there. Yeah, and uh, really appreciate your time. We'll let you go. I know you got a. I know you you, you had a just about an hour, um, but uh, have a wonderful, uh, safe rest of the weekend. Yeah, and uh, thanks for joining the Goslings. Yeah, and if you know if you ever want to join us again, we're gonna do our typewriter one off here in a few minutes. So if you ever want to join us again, bring a typewriter one off. Yeah, That'd be fun. If you ever type from the one master himself. Yeah, you know, absolutely. <laughs> Right. Thanks a lot, guys. It's it's been a pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Doc. Take Talk care. To you later. Be good. <laughs> See ya. Dude, how cool was that? Oh, he was awesome. He's so that great. was awesome. Yeah, he was so yeah. awesome. Yeah, it was Man. great. Oh my gosh. I know. I know. That compendium, those uh, or those um, uh, books that they have of uh, the typewriter stuff, that looks so cool, man. Yeah. 
I got to I got to get on Amazon and get this. This book really is beautiful. Like it doesn't really translate so much on, you know, on camera. But um, I mean, what? It's like it's like less than 30 bucks. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's worth it. It's worth, it's it. worth every yeah. penny. You should charge a lot more Amazon. for that. Yeah. You should charge way more. I mean, my my like crappy paper book paperback is like twenty four dollars or something. I don't even know what it is, but it's like, dude, this is this is beautiful. And um, it's it's formatted really well. Uh, they kind of the publisher really knew what they were doing with the formatting. I don't know how much Dr. Polt had, you know, to do with the actual formatting of the book. Probably a substantial amount. I would assume, but um, but yeah, typewriter yeah. revolution, baby. If you've uh, if you've watched California typewriter, you're probably familiar with Dr. Polt and then the typewriter manifesto. But the book is awesome. It's so. like an actually useful and interesting coffee table book. <laughs> yeah. Because only because <laughs> of the the size and the formatting. Yeah. And, you know, the subject matter, you know, pictures of typewriters and things yeah. like that, you know, but when you open it up and you start actually reading it, you're it's, like, it's awesome. dense. It's yeah. got some really and great, and he's, a, and he's a good writer. Yeah, his writing really is think. good. It's engaging. It's not, uh, you don't get too lost in the weeds on something that you no. don't know anything about. Um, it's very evocative, actually. Like, it really evokes. I don't know how you could emotion. just read the introduction of this. Yeah. And not... I just want to read the rest of the book. Well, and go buy a typewriter. Yeah, and go buy like, a typewriter. It makes you like, yeah. I need one of these things. Why I know. don't I have one of these in my life? I was so pressed for time this week. I did not get to read as much of this as I wanted to, uh, full confession, for the interview. But I remember like laying there in bed, you know, facing the window, reading this, and just feeling the the siren's call of the typewriter yeah. as I'm reading. Yeah, yeah. It's like, no, I can't. I got to read this yeah. book. And like, you know, <laughs> the irony of the two here, you know, like you really do. It makes you, it makes you want to get up and go write a novel on your typewriter. Yeah. Or if you don't have one, it makes you want to like get on Facebook marketplace or Craigslist or whatever. eBay. Or yeah. go down to your local, like do it meat good. space style. Yeah. Go down to your local like pawn shop or antique store. Antique store. Goodwill. Yeah. Dude, that was Flea one market. of the, like when I lived in Florida, I hardly ever spent any time on the computer or the phone. It was like 2014. So, you know, <clears throat> but still, I mean, some of like the coolest memories were like going into antique shops. You know, yeah. Oh, absolutely. These, yeah. Know, these galleries. That's where this one came from. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And, you... and and this uh, Smith Corona back here. Yeah. 54 Smith where did Corona. you find those? Uh, this one was a little uh, side of the road antique store outside of Crossville, Tennessee. And oh, it was yeah. in actually it was actually in their back storage room that I walked into that's accidentally. Right. Yeah. Accidentally, yeah, accidentally, he was called to it like and it's like lightsaber. It's it's and uh, it's over a hundred years old, mm -hmm. and it actually works. And check it out, yeah. that little bell, perfect, it's great, yeah. works. I put paper in there, I put fresh ribbon on it, really? it types. It's it's a yeah. fantastic machine. I cleaned it up a little bit. It needs, I mean, I know it needs a lot of work and like in professional cleaning, but I was able to figure out how to get it working and yeah. clean and everything. So. And it's just amazing to me that something, and it's 100% metal. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you don't see that anymore. No, you don't. You know, it's such a perfectly tuned machine. Yeah. And it's so highly, the, the quality is so high that 100 years later it worked. It's been collecting dust in an attic for probably five, six decades. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's. That's how mine was when I got it. It's amazing. You know, amazing I don't think G-Mama busted that thing out, you know, in like 50 oh, years. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that's. That's the thing, like we've noticed this recently at our house, um, Cameron and I have been fighting the dryer for, well, Cameron's been fighting the dryer. I have been commiserating with him while he, you know, but it's like we live in an age of disposable utilities, yep. disposable yep. appliances, dispo you know, your laptops, your laptop is designed to be disposable. Yeah. Your laptop is designed to be replaced. Your phone is designed to be yep. replaced. Your refrigerator is designed to be replaced, you know, and um, there was a time. You know, and I want to say is maybe like before the before the 80s, before the 70s or 80s, there at least before the 90s, there was a time when things were meant to be repaired, not replaced. Yeah, yeah. And the typewriter was one of them. Yeah. Because as Dr. Bolt describes in good his point. book, that's a good point. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. And he talks about it in the typewriter revolution that, you know, anybody, you know, anybody with tools 
there is actually some he's quoting somebody else but there is a section in here where uh it is almost a list of things that are rebellious against the digital the digital age and it's like anybody with a list of, or with average intelligence and tools can fix these yeah. things yeah clean you them know? and fix them yeah and maintain them, them. yeah and um yep. you know while he's looking for that I do want to find that. Yeah, go ahead and find really that. I'll do this. Uh, if you're still with us, Here thank you. I hope you enjoyed the interview with Dr. Richard Polk. Yeah. That was fantastic. Yeah. Uh, and uh, if, if you subscribe uh, to the Goslings, we'd greatly appreciate it. Uh, we're always yeah. looking for uh, fascinating guests related to what we do. We're writers. Yeah. We're writers. We're self-publishers. We love typewriters. We love the creative process. And we're always looking for uh, people who can, you know, we can interview that can bring value to other like-minded yeah. authors. So I hope you really enjoyed that. Subscribe, hit the bell. That way when we do that, we do this every Sunday yeah. at 430. But anytime we do it, uh, you'll be notified. That would be fantastic. Or if you liked and follow the Facebook page as well, let me mm -hmm. click on that. Did a false, uh, yeah. false click there. Facebook.com uh, forward slash the Goslings. You can find us. Uh, on there as well. Yeah. Plus, we're on Rumble. Plus, we we may up and create a. There, we're on Spotify too. We same may, name. Yeah, that's easy, right. Easy yeah. to find. Uh, yeah, we are on Spotify now and Rumble, and those are two great alternative places if you want to go there. You know, we may be like, you know, digital renegades. Maybe. You know, but we will absolutely use the weapons of the enemy yep. to wage the war. Absolutely. You know? <laughs> We'll, as as they say, we will turn the cannons on them. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. use their own <laughs> tools against them uh -huh. in a way. Yeah, in a way. Yeah, get inside the enemy's camp, baby. Yep. Start lighting fires and <laughs> setting off setting off caches. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, looks like we have a chat here. Let's see. Oh, yeah. we got uh, Adam said it was awesome. Oh, thanks, Adam. Good to have you on, by the way, buddy. Yeah, I'm man. sorry uh, I didn't uh, say hey to you before. We saw you uh, there, so. And uh, Daniel also Terrible made a friends. comment, too. Uh, could not agree more about the typewriter revolution. Uh, I got the book last winter and just had to get my own typewriter after 37 years. 37 of years. years. Yep. Man, that's fantastic. that's as long as computers have been around. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like, thir I'm 38 years old, Daniel. So, like, you using computers yeah, you've for used day one. Yeah. Yeah, you've been using them for almost as long as I've been alive. And. And I mean, I remember I was, it was like the early nineties. I think I was maybe like nine or 10. And I think, uh, you were probably 15, yeah, 14, somewhere. something like that. When, uh, we got our first, it was a Packard bell. We got our first computer at the house, you know, and, uh, and it was whiz bang technology, yep. you know, it was pretty slick and it was a little disappointing because you wanted it to be something more than it was mm -hmm. in some ways, you know, but, um, but then really about 15 years later, 10, 15 years later, you know, you circle back to the typewriter and you're just like, this feels like it's peaceful. There's something peaceful about yeah, the typewriter. Yeah, and this is something I, uh, we ran Logos out of time. Trip. I wasn't able to ask Richard this, uh, but, my fault. you know, if I could go back to, you know, 37, 38 years or however long to that first PC in my house, that first word processor. Yeah, it's totally obsolete now. Yeah, it wouldn't you know, be fun. You know, it's it's arguably as obsolete as a typewriter. Side by side, I would choose a typewriter. Absolutely, I would never go back to that obsolete, you know, digital yeah. to all word, word processors. I would, yeah. I would choose, a, oh I would gosh. choose a typewriter, which is yeah. really interesting because I think <laughs> most people would. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Uh, you mentioned word processor. Uh, so my very first attempt at a book was a science fiction novel that i wrote on mom and dad's brother word processor which which had a it was it was a beige apparatus because it's the 90s baby so it's gotta be beige. it's like the early 90s late 80s um colors were awful back then and you like hinged a, a toggle and the keyboard came down and there was like a screen about oh, yeah. about the size of my hand yeah yeah, yeah. it was black with green type and that's what you, oh, wow. and it ran off of floppy disks. Oh, wow. And I wrote, I tried to write my first book <sighs> off of that thing. And then like, once like Microsoft Word came out and PCs and everything, you would have to go. I even wrote the first, like the first third to first half of Empyrean Falling on that. Wow. You yeah. know, it'd be interesting to find uh, some books that have been published that were written on one of those old word processors. Yeah. And then find another book, maybe by the same author, 
yeah, uh, written on, uh, a, you know, like in Word or something, mm -hmm. and see if they're like, see if the voice is the same. Yeah, see if the voice is. The that's same. a good question. Yeah, that's, you know? that would be cool, yeah. Mister. I want to go to that database you said that uh, the classic typewriter yeah, and figure out what typewriter did some of my favorite authors use, like yeah. Orwell, like Hemingway or Orwell, yeah. yeah, Orwell Hemingway, yeah, yeah. Can't guys. think of anybody else. Had too much bourbon, but whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Brad, Bradbury. Brad, oh, yeah. Bradbury. Bradbury yeah. probably used one. Uh, Heinlein. I would love to know what typewriter Heinlein used. Yeah. Dude. That'd be cool. That'd be super cool. Yeah. I mean, because, you know, I'll tell you like. Well, J.K. Rowling. Oh, yeah. Used to use a typewriter. Did you really? Yeah, she did. Really? Yeah. Yeah. And I know that because I copied and pasted a quote into a Instagram post about Man. it. That's, that's, I don't know. You might want to fact check she that. She may be a witch, but she's a sexy witch. <laughs> <laughs> she's a very attractive I'm, and I'm very wealthy saying, woman yeah look and, and i'm just saying jk she had a worthy break and i'm happy for her it's yeah, awesome i mean what sure. a what a legacy yeah. um i'll tell you the nightmare though you don't really have this problem with a typewriter the nightmare of going from a word processor to a pc yeah is uh you have to reformat now oh ugh, ugh. Think about all the spacing. Yeah. I spent Gross. weeks Gross. doing that. When I took those floppy disks ah. and I loaded them onto that PC and had MS Word, you know, cross-platform, sort of like going from mm. a Mac to a PC. Yeah, dude, it was Thank you know. hell. It was absolute <laughs> hell. So, Oh, man. I found the thing I was looking for, though. Um, or uh, here we go. Uh, I'll just go ahead and read it because this actually is uh, – this is – Pretty cool. This speaks to the time. I got I, Daniel actually. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, we got back to Daniel said uh, I'm going to pull this up real quick. Yeah, sure. Uh, I said it was it was in 1984 that my oldest brother got his first IBM XT clone with floppy disks. Wow. With a word processor and Lotus 123 spreadsheet. Is that like a printer? Man, I could just hear the like. Yeah. You know, I could just hear it. Oh man. Yeah. Crazy. Like some it, Skynet technology. It, it sounds kind of like the very first time I ever typed anything on on any kind of computer. It was like back in, I don't know, 94, 93, 94. We had a computer and I had a, I didn't type anything until I was in college. Yeah. And I actually had to type some, type out and print a paper yeah. that was required. The first time I ever used it. And it was like this awful experience <laughs> typing <laughs> and then having to format it and then print it out. Yeah. The printer never works. The printer of still course. never works. The printer never works ever. Even at work, dude, where it's like, it's a touchscreen Lenovo, you know, uh, computer. It's a nice printer. Dude. They're connected by Wi-Fi. Dude, let me and it still is like, I'm out of paper. Ugh. Freaking Elon you know. Musk wants to fly to Mars and yeah, why don't you just create robots. A, yeah. Why don't you just create a printer that works? Yeah, why don't you create a, a non-crappy printer first, Elon? Yeah, yeah why don't you then, do that? Dude, we've been fighting the printer war at my house for the longest time, me and Cameron, trying to find a good suck. printer. Because like we have this crappy color printer that even when you're trying to print black and white, if like the red or the yellow is out then it won't print you are like i just want to print black and white yeah i just want to print my my 1099 you know and uh and it won't do it no. and so and it makes me think of around the same time i was into the nikon f2 manual slr and i was getting into the typewriter yeah, yeah. uh i had spent because i was i was in i was deep and serious about writing the first novel i had spent like three or four hundred dollars on like a brother printer just yeah, yeah. a boxy yeah gonk like <laughs> brother takes printer. half the desk up yeah oh yeah and it just gonk gonk you, you, gonk, gonk, you know i mean it, but you know what it's you, like the gonk droid yeah it's like I'm a gonk droid yeah. it really did look yeah, like yeah. one and you plugged it right into your computer there's no wi-fi there's no magic sorcery yeah. you know and um but it worked it worked every time and it printed off everything and it worked like a charm yeah. until like it i think it got damaged in a move somewhere nah. Uh, yeah, but if I could go back, if I could get like that printer up and working, like that's like a twenty year old printer. That's what I love about the typewriter; it print, prints black, white, and red, and yeah. it prints as you type. Prints as you type, baby. Yep, you don't it have to worry about any of that crap. One man office machine, <laughs> so for one stop shop, baby. <laughs> you know, come on down. Uh, so, all right, go back to your back to oh, your yeah. find. Uh, this is on page twenty eight of the Typewriter Revolution by Richard Pohl, uh, Doctor Richard Pohl. 
or there's author famous Wendell Berry, or uh, excuse me, or there's author farmer Wendell Berry, who published a contrarian essay back in 1987 titled Why I Am Not Going to Buy a Computer. 1987. My wife types my work on a Royal Standard typewriter bought new in 1956 and as good now as it was then. I would hate to think that my work as a writer could not be done without a direct dependence upon strip mined coal. Mm -hmm. To make myself as plain as I can, I should give my standards for technological innovation in my own work. They are as follows. One, the new tool should be cheaper than the one it replaces. Two, it should be at least as small in scale as the one it replaces. Three, it should do work that is clearly and demonstrably better than the one it replaces. Four, it should use less energy than the one it replaces. Five, if possible, it should use some form of solar energy such as that of the body. Six, it should be repairable by a person of ordinary intelligence, provided that he or she has the necessary tools. Seven, it should be purchasable and repairable as near to home as possible. Eight, it should come from a small, privately owned shop or store that will take it back for maintenance and repair. And nine, it should not replace or disrupt anything good that already exists and this includes family and community relationships. Wow. And wow. Then, yeah. And the last little paragraph. So basically, it's not talking about this. <laughs> right. Basically, yeah. And that's basically Everything what he this says. Is not. Yeah. Uh, at the bottom, um, Richard Polt's uh, uh, commentary picks up again and says, uh, Barry claims that using a computer to replace a typewriter would be wrong on all of these counts. Actually, by most of the Barry rules, a typewriter makes a great replacement for a computer. The Barry Rules. The Typewriter Revolution, baby. I love it. Yeah, it's awesome. It is such a cool book. It's so much fun to read. It's awesome. Yeah. It's, it is great. That was neat that we got to interview him. And if you yeah. haven't seen California Typewriter, and I'm sure you guys have, but if you haven't, yeah, I mean, you got to go check it out. It's actually going to, it should be in the comments of this video, the link to yeah. all this, the book, the manifesto, the websites, yeah. um, the documentary. Definitely watch that. It's so yeah. fantastic. Nick so preempted good. all that stuff. Usually I do that stuff on the back end, but uh, I was so excited. Nick, <laughs> yeah, I was so excited. Uh, Nick, about Nick has nailed it, man. Yeah. You know, he's well, making my job easier and easier every well, episode. Yeah, you know, it was a hard week, and I was looking forward to it. I needed the distraction. He did, so. man. Nick's had a hard week. <laughs> he deserves this. I do. It's true. It's true. I'll yeah. give myself that. Let's do one offs. Yeah, Type brother, brother one offs, baby. So every week we do this. We uh, we do a one pager. Ostensibly, theoretically, theoretically, uh, it is a one pager today, so you're in luck. Double space, <laughs> double so. space. Yeah, how much oh, trouble man. can I get us in double space? Yeah. One page. <laughs> you know, come on. After last oh, week. Oh man. <laughs> no, you're fine. I can see him. I can see him puckering right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little nervous. I can see I that lie. dry socket developing right now. You know. Yeah. No, I'm kidding. It's fine. All right. Let's see who goes first. All right. One, two, three, shoot. One, two, three, shoot. One, two, three, shoot. One, two, three, shoot. There we go. <laughs> That's the longest we've ever gone. That's pretty long. Yeah. That's All pretty right. long. You want me to go first? Yeah, you go first. All right, cool. All right, in keeping with the theme of today's episode and our excellent interview with Dr. Polt, here we go. I won't lose your last saved work. I won't autocorrect your grammar. I won't insist on adding Oxford commas. I won't run out of batteries. I won't require an update in the middle of your dance with the muse. Mm. I am not here to second guess or undermine you. I am not here to make you feel dumb or inadequate. I won't jack up your formatting or have some artifact in the coding that turns your heaven sent inspiration into indecipherable hieroglyphics. I am a typewriter, your loyal friend. Sure, I occasionally need a new ribbon or service due to my mechanical nature, but you can spill your drink of choice on me, hot or cold, and the worst you'll get is some mild rust and the pungent, sour stink of whatever your concoction was, giving up its ghost to the airy ether. Yes, you will have to hunt and peck with me. I am a little slow. Yes, you do not have a backspace or delete function. 
Yes, there is no copy paste, short of scissors and scotch tape. But that is what you get with me. I am a vessel of your will. I am a machine, unthinking, with no will or AI or algorithm. Like a sword or a sail, I am ex an extension of your will, ready to do your bidding at a moment's notice. So take care. Perform your maintenance. Ensure that I am operating at peak physical capacity. For together, we will slay the dreaded thinking machines and build worlds with every inky hammer stroke, like paladins of old. And to hell with those Oxford commas. Who needs Hey, man. Hey, man. <laughs> Very nice. Very Ooh. nice. I love it. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, the type... <sighs> Dude, I wrote it's that. It's an instrument of your will. It, it is, and and yeah. I love I love when you said, uh, "I won't uh, I won't require an update in the middle of your dance with the muse." Yeah, because we've been there. The writer, yeah, he's the writer. Dude, I had that happen. Probably, I think that's probably about a month old at this point. Uh, I had it happen a while ago where uh, I had written five or six pages. I mean, on Sasquatch lips. Yeah, yeah. And it was like drawing blood from a stone. Yeah. You know, like it just was not coming out. It wasn't and, happening. No, there was some creative constipation that was going on. <laughs> yeah. That since Adam, yeah. by the way, oh. I have, uh, I have like removed the blockage on, and it yeah. has been a, a font of creativity. Uh, you've gotten a lot like of work done this week, you know, from what yeah. you were telling me earlier. So I reached a stopping place at about 180 something pages. Uh, Fantastic, Adam. So I can detail off and get to work on the next angel book for you. Um, because we had talked about that. I'm a week late. He's that, talking to so. Adam Burl, who's our narrator for our books. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Adam Burl's from the UK. Yeah, let's throw a, can we throw his... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Real quick, because we'll come back to Top Rider. Uh, yeah, let's do it. Got it right here. Yeah. Adam Burl. Yeah. A fantastic narrator, uh, audible narrator, and yeah. uh, his wife, Dee Burl, uh, who makes wonderful uh, resin products, custom-made resin uh, design products. Yeah. So definitely check both of them out. Yeah, they're awesome. Um, so, yeah, I... Dude, I had eked out like three pages, mm -hmm. and the, and it was tough. It took a long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the computer didn't save them. Oh my gosh! And so I had like I thought I clicked on all the things and done all the things, but the computer was just like oh, eh, no. Yeah. And then the battery died, you know, because the plug wasn't in right or whatever. Yeah. It's a little worn out, and uh, and yeah, so I I lost. I had to redo it, you yeah. know, and and like. For some people, redoing it can be better. It could be like one step back, two steps forward kind of thing. Uh -huh. But like, I'm kind of like Pressfield in that like my first shot is usually my most accurate. Yeah, you know, like I don't, I don't do a lot of. Not everybody works that way, and sometimes it's better. You know, sometimes it can be better to go back and. Yeah, but you know, especially while time. you were reading yours, uh, it reminded me. Of um, something I, I've heard. It was like a record movie. scratch on the dance with Muse. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know. I've watched like just n countless uh, like typewriter repair videos on YouTube. Oh yeah, I, you know, read through sites and listened to podcasts and all this stuff. And one common thing I keep hearing over and over and over from repairmen that find these old typewriters and clean them and repair them, like a very common comment they make is about the cigarette smells <laughs> it's how the typewriter smells yeah. when it's first found in the in the antique store yeah. or the estate sale whatever and they get it and they have to clean it it's like <laughs> there's this punch like just sick, coated with like nicotine and cigarette yeah. smoke smell yeah it's sour and, uh, yeah stink of like cigarettes. in the 40s 50s and 60s right and there's that's so the many of, of these machines that's the made of cigarettes yeah absolutely mm -hmm. and uh i don't know well keeping that tradition alive right it's and pretty much <laughs> And, uh, you know, and it just makes, yeah, it just means there was That's actual so writer yeah. sitting at the keys, yeah, you know, putting well, their DNA into the, uh, yeah, onto, the yeah. onto the typewriter. I mean, it's better than what could have been on that typewriter. Hey, right. man, well, in, well, in, well, in Charlie Mikowski's case, I think so. there was more of the nicotine states. <laughs> Don't run a black, black light over that, over that typewriter. Um, no, you know, it, that's a good point because um, uh, our, our cousin Andy, I was talking to our cousin Andy about that one time. And he was like, you know what, man? And you and I had talked about it before. Like, you know what, man? You're a writer. Like, you're creative. You know, just just smoke. You're going to do it, you know? Right. I mean, he was like, you know, it'd be great if you could quit. You know, that'd be great. But honestly, you know, 
it's almost like because I think you had told me before, just about every writer has some a vice. A vice. Yeah, they have some a vice. sort of vice. A chemical vice. Many of them. Most of them yeah. have a chemical vice. Mine's coffee. Mine's coffee. caffeine. Yeah. Strong, like a straight espresso. Yeah. Just pounding it. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And it's true. Like I mean, all of my best writing is done with the worst thing in the world is what I was going through at two a.m. yet last night. What is to have your laptop all the way up in your bedroom where you're doing your writing, but the back patio is where you smoke your cigarettes and take your break. <laughs> so you gotta, can't smoke inside. <laughs> go all the way outside, you know, and have. And by the time you like, you know, you you have a cigarette or two, and you're. You know, it's it, it's a break from the universe. You know, it's sort of like having an espresso. But does the muse wait for you? Does she allow you the smoke break? Well, that's where a lot of the best stuff comes in, because it's okay, like getting so a, she's, she takes a smoke break with you. Yeah, she's waiting for me. Oh wow! Yeah, she's a little demonic, little temptress out there. She's like, <laughs> yes, come on. You know, she's you know. I bet and, she's uh, ugly. She's probably yeah. She's probably a hag. Yeah, you know, just messed up teeth. <laughs> Yeah. But her Instagram profile is smoking. Yeah, but her Instagram, yeah, lots of filters. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's great. Anyways. All right, I guess it's my turn. Uh, now that I've had Adam is way too sweet. Thank a you, Adam. glass and a half of bourbon. Yeah. <laughs> All right, here we go. Here's my one off. And this is not really in can keeping. I see this? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You can field the questions and chats and such. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Mine is actually fiction. The diner was packed that morning, more so than the usual Saturday. The breakfast crowd was larger than normal because the rain didn't allow for much else on a cold February weekend. The coffee was in such high demand that it could barely be brewed fast enough. Thus, it was constantly fresh and seditiously hot. Mike sat alone drawing silent, angry glares from patrons waiting in line for the next open table. Mike didn't sit at the counter, as is expected of parties of one. He liked his space, and a booth was what he required. He would not give up his prime position if asked either. God help the ignorant, impatient soul who dared to ask Mike to move. The anxiety of self-awareness in situations like these did not affect Mike. He was locked in his thoughts, staring deep into the cheap white porcelain mug, now empty. That mug held the visions of his entire tour of Vietnam, and from it, Mike could hear the echoes of agony and the tremors of what was inevitably going to happen again soon. This time, the war would be domestic. In reality, it had already begun. It was what his compatriots called a quote, cold civil war. Some of his southern buddies called it, quote, the war of northern aggression, take two. <laughs> Call it what you may. Mike knew that there would come a catalyst moment where the cold civil war would flash into a hot one. He was the agent of that change. He had received his orders, and the moment was fast approaching. It would happen in the diner that very morning when the legal occupancy limit had reached its maximum <laughs> only three more bodies needed he glanced out the window to see if more patrons were on their way to the diner's front door sure enough a family of four piled out of a sedan and ran with their heads covered by their hands to the d d diner's awning the diner was now one person over its limit Mike called the waitress over to his booth. Refill on the coffee, please, was all he said. As she scurried off to obey, he pulled his flip phone from his pocket and called the fire department. Not the 911 type of call, just the line to the closest station, Station 2. Travis was on duty waiting for the ring. <laughs> Travis picked up without answering. All Mike had to say was, time the fireman played his part and reported the diner and its over occupancy to the fire chief who in turn unaware that he was part of the scheme jumped in his de uh, jumped in his department issued ford explorer and headed to the diner the waitress returned with a refill 
and slid the check onto Mike's table with an irritable glance. She said nothing, but Mike knew that she was signaling him to leave. Mike, of course, took his sweet time, sipping the ever-fresh coffee while keeping his eye on the parking lot. Any moment, the fire chief and a few firemen would arrive, as planned, cramming just a few more unsuspecting souls into the diner. Then, and only then, would Mike make his stand and commit what had recently been deemed by the White House as an act of domestic terror. Hmm. The chief and his men arrived within minutes, and much to Mike's surprise and sick pleasure, a few police officers as well. Perfect, he thought. No one deserves this more than the police. The booth with the mugs, uh, sorry, uh, with one pleasing draw, Mike finished his coffee in his mug. He rose from the booth with a mug in his hand, and in one wide dramatic movement, smashed the mug onto the floor. The diner fell silent and stared at Mike, who then jumped up onto the booth table. He ripped his flannel shirt to the sides with both hands and exposed his chest, which was covered by a T-shirt, a tacky airbrushed American flag <laughs> with a portrait of an eagle before it. Awesome. Gasps erupted from the patrons and nervous parents covered the eyes of their frightened little ones. <laughs> Mike wasted no time, but placed his open right hand on his chest just over his heart. People began to scream at him. And the police could see the terrible act through the window <laughs> and were pushing their way through the mass of huddled patrons blocking the front door. But they'd never make it to Mike in time. <laughs> he drew a breath and began. I pledge allegiance to the flag. <laughs> An officer's nine millimeter round slammed through Mike's hand and into his heart just before he got to liberty and justice for all. <laughs> when the officer lowered his weapon, a cook, two waitresses, and a dozen patrons removed their hats and they began. Yeah. I pledge allegiance to the flag. The revolution had begun. <laughs> yeah, baby, that's yeah, awesome. Thank you. I love it. On the Smith Corona. Yeah. Dude, did you really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, fun. man. That, that was, was good. Thanks, man. Yeah. I ran out of room. I got to the end of the page, and I had to cram everything into, like, two lines. Uh-huh. Shoot. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, that's called true discipline, unlike what I do, which is like, whoop, whoop, I don't know. We're flipping the page over. So here we go. <laughs> whoop. And you'd be proud of me. I wrote it yesterday. Oh, nice. Instead of today. Yeah. Because... I knew I'd be pressed for time. Which today. do you think gives you the better output when you when you have the time to maneuver that into your life or when you're under the pressure of the gun to the head? I mean, it's always going to get done, but right. I think I enjoyed it more, and I think it was a slightly better result doing it a day ahead. Yeah. 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 I mean, that makes sense because, you know, this is something that I didn't know until recently, but it makes sense. I've just never heard anybody like quantify it. Um, stress and anxiety, uh, you know, that create cortisol uh, in the brain, um, actively diminishes uh, your cognitive ability. Mm. That's why in military boot camps and basic training, they try to replicate combat stress as much as possible. Hmm. Not just to inculcate you to it and get you desensitized to it because you need to be in order to function, but also to eliminate your ability to just, they say it in the, in the gun world, uh, fingers turn to flippers in a, mm. you know, shooting situation, yeah. you know? And um, so it is true though. Like the more nervous you are about doing something, performance anxiety, it's real. Yeah. yeah. But it happens cre creatively as well. The more nervous you are about something, you know, yeah. the more likely ability you're going to, you the know. The more anxiety you have. You know, and I wonder if that translates anxiety, to, yeah. like, the use of the typewriter. Because if you're, if I'm writing on a laptop, just a regular part of your routine, when you go, you sit down, you open your laptop, and you start writing. Yeah. And you, you can check the news. Yeah. And I often do. Yeah, you can check out. And yeah. when you see all that coming at you. Yeah. 
you can you can you can get stressed out yeah you know you can start yeah. flooding your brain with that uh with that anxiety with all that bad news and starting to wonder about that and get angry mm-hmm. about things or upset or sad or yeah you know you see someone's kid that got you know tragic eaten by a lion yeah and then you know all maybe something politically that oh, wait, irritates you get sad. angry about or just stuff you can't control and that's in your mind now and it's flooding your brain with maybe cortisol and you can't you can't exercise that that creative muscle as much yeah it's the same it's the same reason why uh adrenaline dumps give you the shakes so like i experienced it deer hunting um, the first couple times I would see a deer, actually probably the first few times I saw a deer, uh, deer hunting, you know, 30 feet up in a tree climber, you know, or, or wherever, um, you see a deer it's cold. Cause it's like December, November, yeah, yeah. you know, but you're, you're not that cold cause you're wearing whatever, you know, layers, but, uh, I would see a deer and then like when the moment had passed, you know, if I didn't get a shot. Or if I did take the shot and kill the deer afterwards, my knees would start to bounce from the, and it's not, it's, it's a uh, chemical. It's purely chemical. It's adrenaline. Yeah. Your adrenaline, when you get the shake, when you get the shakes, it's because the adrenaline has flooded your bloodstream and your bloodstream, your muscles are now deprived of oxygen. So they are literally like shaking because oh, wow. they don't have enough oxygen because there's too much adrenaline flowing through your veins. Oh, wow. So I think the same thing happens on a cognitive ability neurochemically with cortisol in relation to anxiety. I th- it's got to be the same thing. You know, I mean, look, you know, I am I am not a doctor. We here at the Goslings are not doctors. No. So, you know, I could very easily be wrong about what I'm saying, but it is you can see the logic behind. Yeah, yeah. It, that like I do. I think, you know, the more stressed out you get, the less the less you can think is the long and short of it yeah and um anxiety can do that a lot of anxiety uh you've heard of that adam yeah Adam says he's heard that yeah 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 Yeah, i think it's uh, i think it's they touched on it a little bit in that uh, mini series that hbo mini series generation kill which actually is really funny it's not uh it's not exciting but it is funny and it seems like the internet if you're on a device expected the internet the internet's whole mission yeah. Is to interrupt you and get news or notifications yeah. or emails or whatever. Listen to it is this in new song by Rihanna. Constantly. Did you see what Mel Gibson said? Yeah. You know, and oh, it doesn't matter how many notifications tweets, you turn off. You know? Yeah, it's stuff. designed to distract you and yeah. suck you into whoever's paying them the most money. Yeah, and mo- most advertising dollars. That's why uh, I really admire you, and I really admire Adam also. Because both of you guys are able to be pretty prolific and disciplined in your concentration levels without having to revert to, you know, it's, it's sort of like, like I would have to do that because I am kind of like an alcoholic who cannot, you know, cannot be around booze, you know? Right. So like their answer is to, their answer to not drinking in excess. The is nuclear to not option. Be around. Yeah. yeah. The nuclear option. Yeah. Yeah. yeah just nuclear. Return to the Sulaco and nuke it from orbit. Right. You know? <laughs> um, yeah. Well, we won't talk about that. Um, <laughs> but like, but the true admiration and the true discipline is in the people who can have one or two beers and go home. Yeah. It, the same sense of like the people who can, you know, exist on a computer, but but resist the temptation to, you know, open up. I mean, here, how insidious is it? You open up a blank tab on your browser and it pulls up a bunch of hot news articles yep you know yep things meant to grab your attention whether yep. it's ads or you can't articles. type anything into gmail google docs you know or or your gmail and it's trying to guess what you're going after because it wants yeah. to get it there to you before you right type it yourself yeah uh and uh, and it wants to pull you away yeah um it's it's uh it's kind of seditious really oh it's incredibly insidious yeah. yeah. Um, well, well, yeah, let's do weekend review. We can review. Hell, you ran in third base here. Yeah. I yeah. wrote a little more of Easel Bancroft. Did I, you? I actually get, went to Were you uh, in a medicated stupor when you wrote it. Yeah, no. Well, <laughs> yeah, I had I had dental surgery done, so I've been on meds all week. Yeah. So it was fantastic week in yeah. that regard. Uh, but no, but seriously, uh, I'm halfway through. I'm in act two B. 
And I decided that to or be not in to three, be. <laughs> to be or not to be. But I kind of re, like I, I changed up the plot a little bit. Yeah. I'm following the story structure, but I'm kind of changing some things in the plot. Yeah. Uh, and that gave me kind of fresh wind. Good for you. To keep pushing forward through it. Good yeah. For you. Yeah. you know, that's a that's an important crossroads that every every writer is going to have to face, which is do you stay the course and lose motivation and lose inspiration and maybe finish something that is lackluster because you stayed the course? Yeah. Well, it or, might be lackluster, even though I, even if I finish this well, new thing, well, you know, I'll I mean, be more excited about yeah, it. Yeah, whatever. I mean, yeah. you know, we'll see. We'll, uh, we'll see what we'll see after Adam. I'll like it more. <laughs> but yeah, but that's the other thing is like yeah. you know when you or do you do you take you know the road less traveled? Do you take the fork in the road that leads you, you know, down the you know the path of of uncertainty and adventure, where it's like, man, we're breaking the mold. Yeah. Here. This is not the plan, you know, but, but like they say, man, you know, no plan survives first contact with the enemy and who's yeah. the enemy resistance, baby. Yeah. You know, uh, Mike Tyson said, you know, everybody's got a plan till you get punched in the face. <laughs> Everyone has a plan to get punched in the mouth. <laughs> you get punched in the mouth, you know, and, but it's true creatively too. Yeah. It's like, you can reach For a sure. point where you, you know, I, I can't remember. I know I've had that happen in the angel books before where you reach a point where you're like, I kind of thought this was going to be another thing. Yeah. You know? Yep. Uh, Sturm and Drang was like that. I kind of thought Sturm and Drang was initially going to be about the Gregorian, the Nephilim, and, you know, the fallen, you know, and their empire and all of this different stuff. But it turned into something far more personal than that, by the, especially by the time I actually sat down and wrote it. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing, you know, with Ezel Bancroft. You can, mm -hmm. you can stay the course and doggedly stick to your guns of what you think it should be. It might be okay. But there's a risk, but the payoff is just like anything, any risk, man. You know, you, you roll the dice and it might actually be better to. I think it will be. I really do. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I think this new direction is going to be better. Well, it probably will, especially as a creative writer, because you're going to be more motivated, you know? Yeah. Like people can tell when you're just paint by numbers, you know, yeah. or at least. You can tell when you're paint by numbers. And there are so many paint by numbers books out there, self published. Yeah. Follow, you know, story structure A, yeah. B, C. You know what's going to happen before it happens. Yeah. You can guess what character is going to do what. Um, you know, yeah. and there's just a lot of that out there. And I know that that's what sells. Uh oh. Oh, guess uh -oh. what time it is, baby? Guess what time it's it is. It's time for Click on this right here. This, this, this one? one? Yep. It's time for this one. It is potato cam, potato after cam, party, after party, the part of the show where my uh, my good camera battery dies and we have to revert to the potato cam built in to the you monitor know what? of my. I iPad. forgot. You know what? It's pit vipers time. <laughs> you know what? Might as well pour me a little more fun juice. Might as well. If you wanna be my lover, you gotta get with my friends. If you wanna be my lover, friendship never ends. <laughs> ah, potato cam after party. Potato cam. Okay. Adam calls after it the party. Adam calls it the peanut butter camera time. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes. Peanut butter. Yeah. It's peanut yeah. butter jelly time. Peanut butter jelly time. <laughs> peanut butter jelly time. Um, we just do this for like another 10 minutes. I'm so hungry. I've been so hungry for like an hour. Yeah, now. I'm hungry too. I'm, really just I'm hungry too. <laughs> that's that's the funny thing about potato cam after party is that like we, you know, we want to we want to do it when it happens because it's an opportunity to get a little silly. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But like we have to pee and we're so hungry and I want a cigarette. That like we're so over it, but it's the time like this comes around. It's like the the, <laughs> the gods of podcasting and live stream are like, all right, you're done. Yeah, you're done now. You're it's, done. Give me the battery. It's time. Get out. Yep. Go eat. Get out. Go Get harass some waitresses at the go, Mexican restaurant. You know, go commit a hate crime. You know, you're done go, here. Go Get out. commit a bunch of crimes as as a no, you know backup cameras. Yeah, they make nope. us pay for it. Nope, I don't answer to Olympus. <laughs> I do my own thing. You know, I show up with my jacked up hat and my pit vipers. We got these pit vipers for the gun shop. Yeah. And uh, we got them off of Alibaba. Okay. <laughs> like if you've ever, if you've never been, uh, I'm wearing, I'm wearing these ironically, but they actually are extremely polarized. They're actually really good little 
sunglasses cool. to have. If you go to the Pit Vipers website, anything you've ever watched on the live stream that like you're like, God, these guys are such a waste of time. Go to the Pit Vipers website. We will have totally redeemed ourselves. It's okay. hilarious. Okay, good. It's like intentionally late 80s, early 90s. Oh, wow. Okay. And it's awful and therefore hilarious. <laughs> they know it. But they sell these for like 80 to 140 bucks. Oh, geez. These are expensive wow. friggin', you know, face goggles. Yeah. You know? Looks like the Blast Shield. It does look like from, a Blast uh, Shield, right? That's why yeah, I love it. Yeah. A Rebel Blast Shield. Yeah. And well, I think they're like popularized by like Dale Earnhardt, you know, or, or Jeff Gordon. Yeah, yeah. You know, in like the late 80s, early 90s, like <laughs> rad movement. So they're kind of back in style now. There's some really funny videos uh, of uh, for Pit Vipers out there on YouTube. They're like a thing now. They're a trendy little thing. But, um, but dude, we got these things off of Alibaba for like, you know, between like four and ten dollars. Yeah, pop. nice. You know, so I've just been like, nice. I've just been like rocking the PBs nice. the whole time. It's been awesome. So, so I got a little more writing done, and yeah. I did the thing for the, you know, the one off for this, just getting ready for reading the yeah. book, typewriter revolution, so forth. What about you? What have you been doing this week? Uh, well, and also, I just want to say real quick, I want to give kudos to Nick because Nick does eighty-five to ninety percent of all the work. For this live stream so like yeah, if you enjoy nice the live stream if you enjoy how this looks you know if you enjoy watching this on rumble or if you're catching this on facebook or um or instagram or spotify or spotify yep. now that we're on spotify yep. like if you enjoyed this you know, all kudos go to nick because Appreciate i'm that. i am like the nick nolte of the <laughs> Uh, you know, I just like show up and I try not to say too many bad You're the words. Kurt Russell of Stargate. You're supposed to show up and trigger the ball. Just, mm, you know, I don't. And I get to be the James Spader. Yeah, he gets to be the James Spader, decipher all the hieroglyphs, do all the hard work. I just come in and just, yeah, and then yeah, just, yeah. you know, nuke it. Nuke it for more of it, baby. <laughs> you know, so, so no, seriously, big thank you to Nick for his ongoing efforts Thanks, to man. do this. I appreciate it. I'm, I'm glad always, to do it. It's fun. You know, I'm always trying not to, uh, not to jack it up too much or <laughs> sabotage it. <laughs> Yeah, I might sabotage with sweet pit vipers because you want to be like Macho Man Randy Savage. You know what? After we you eat... snap into a Gosling's live stream, <laughs> snap into a live stream, snap into a live stream. <laughs> Dude, you put these pit vipers on, you will have so much fun. It's like because no one, try you know, yeah, I gotta get you a pair. I really, man. Ah, I knew I screwed up something. I should have gotten him a pair of PVs. <laughs> we'll do this. We'll do this all next episode. It'll be great. Um, so yeah, no, uh, my life. Uh, I reached 180 something pages in uh, Sasquatch Ellipse, uh, which affords me the ability. To, I'm actually at a really good stopping point. It's the Sasquatch Apocalypse. That's yeah. what he's right. Roman it's Coke and the Sasquatch Ellipse. Oh, that's the brilliant. Sasquatch. It's a great title. It's great title. Fun. And it's been very like it has been a little paint by numbers because it's kind of like a little tongue in cheek. Yeah. It's not supposed to be taken super seriously, but it's a lot of fun. Uh, and then uh, had a great conversation with my marketing manager, uh, Jamie. Uh, a couple days ago and um, or over the past couple days and uh, we got some really good things that we're going to plan for the goslings um we got uh, we got some really cool stuff in the works uh this was awesome but um we're gonna maybe like try and focus on uh spoilers uh maybe doing like a highlight reel you yeah. know yeah. uh like a secondary channel a secondary goslings channel uh where it's just going to be five four to seven minute videos of just like our our funniest highlights yeah our best most moments interesting. yeah just best moments just a highlights channel so it's more digestible for anybody who's watching it uh we got some more guests lined up yep. you know some really good ones um some ones that you might oh i'm so excited in. about that next month no I is that yeah so september right? is, yeah, well, yeah let's announce the like, date might as well announce the date september yeah. 12th right 12th september 12th Gary Wayne, the man, the myth, the legend. We're gonna get Gary Wayne for up to two hours. Oh my gosh, dude! He can he can join the potato cam after party. He can join potato cam after party. He can be in the peanut PVs. butter cam after party. Yeah, <laughs> this would be great. Adam, do you want some of these pit vipers? Because I will for sure mail you some, dude. <laughs> yeah, I bet you know what. Maybe I bet, I bet, mail D, I bet D could stuff. make some. Oh my gosh, That'd D! Be cool. If can you make. Can you make sweet ass pit bees? You make some sweet ass pit vipers. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Because I can't talk about pit vipers without sounding like Macho Man Randy Savage. Uh... <laughs> freaks out my inner white trash. Oh, my inner great. redneck. I'm sorry, you can't say you can't say whiskey tango on. Uh... Adam, <laughs> yeah, right? wants, Adam wants. I'm some. telling you, Adam, they're pretty dope. Adam says, 
I want some, as do I, mm -hmm. as do all of us. As do we all. Yeah. Yeah. Even, even the, yeah, never mind. Pit yeah. vipers inject testosterone. Yeah. Into yeah. a man who puts them on his face. Yep. Yep. I don't, I don't gotta, Strikes. I don't gotta take no pellets. I just, <laughs> I just put these PVs on and all of a sudden I'm through the roof, baby. <laughs> I'm a, I'm Apollo. I'm Apollo. Oh, that's great. I'm Apollo 13. I'm on the other side of the moon. You can't even talk to me. I'm so rad. I'm outer space. That's such a myth. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm a hobby desert. I'm Stanley Kubrick, baby. It'll be 80, 80 freaking years before you find out the magic that I have. <laughs> I can do all episodes. <laughs> so anyways. I so yeah. Uh, uh, oh, also, I got uh, author copies in for Wayfair, so I finally have enough material for Jamie and I to spin up a Facebook okay. ad uh, for the um, A Man at Arms by Stephen Pressfield, and then with the bookmarks and all the other stuff, uh, all the copies of my book, stickers and everything. Um, if you want a copy of um, Wayfarers or a signed copy of A Man at Arms, uh, contact me. Or contact Nick if you want a copy of a signed copy of A Man at Arms. Uh, we have them signed by Stephen Pressfield. Yep. Uh, that interview was amazing. We're hoping to line up more interviews in the future. Um, let's see. What else? Um, I'm going to start working on the next Angel book for Adam uh, this week. And uh, I think that's I think that's probably about it. We got, we got the Gary Wayne interview squared away. Yep. yep. Um, yeah. Typewriter Revolution has happened. Uh, yeah, it's been, uh, it's been, it's been a good week. Yeah, it, it's been a long week. A long week, like, but it's been fun. It, this yeah. was the culmination. This yeah. was the high the, the, the high point of the week. Oh, dude, yeah. I sat on, like, Nick didn't know about this, by the way, until, like, earlier today. I'm so excited about meeting Gary Wayne. He probably, like, guessed it because I'm really bad at keeping secrets. No, I didn't. I mean, I, I was thinking, is it, like, the Blurry Creatures guys? I thought it was oh, yeah. Gary Wayne. Is it, you know... I don't know. I had a lot of names go through my head. Really? I really did. Yeah. And uh, and ran, my wife was like, no, I don't know who it is. Jonathan hasn't said anything to me. I'm I like, know I couldn't. Who yeah. is it going to? Who is Because I know where her loyalties lie as yeah. a good wife, you know? Yeah, well. Yeah. Yeah. I, and she wouldn't tell me. She would. But I think I would guess it if she knew. Yeah. You know? You're, oh, yeah, yeah. Because I wouldn't be able to help myself yeah. poking and prodding like a like Sherlock freaking Holmes. <laughs> right. See, that's a, the that's a thing. Like, you know, you got to you got to sometimes keep a secret out of love for not just the person you want to keep the secret from for their own sake, but also for the people around them. You yeah, know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like if you tell the people around them now, they are burdened yeah. with the, uh, you know, with the secret. So, and uh, do you say we're doing Todd next week? Is he going to join us? Yeah. So I think, uh, I think, um, yeah, we might have another, uh, fun, like, like a in third house. Yeah. Third yeah. House that'd be cool. That'll be a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, and um, he's great, man. Hilarious, yeah, we'll be, lots of personality. We'll be pretty. Uh, we'll be pretty disappointed he's a solid about dude. that. But yeah, we love Todd, and uh, you know we can't talk a whole lot about Todd. He's a little bit of a secret squirrel. Yeah. But uh, but Todd and I, we talked about that. We were like, okay, we can either we got two options, Todd. We can either mention, like, talk about who you are and what you do, you know, and we can promote, or we can like. Give you a fake name. Not mention that and go deep. Ah. And Todd was like, go deep. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he was like, yes. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, Fantastic. Let's see. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I got a message from a buddy that says, I want to comment on your Vipers so bad. Pit Vipers are like the Jamaican bobsled team of classes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they are. Cool yeah. running space. Yeah. We had the cool runnings of the live stream world, man. Uh, Look at us with our cool Pit Vipers. Dude, I will get. Oh, by the way. Uh, you're watching. I have your sunglasses, by the way. Nick found them. Yeah. You left them here. Nick found them. They're your like four dollar, you know, voodoo Ouija board sunglasses. Yeah, yeah. That you'll never be able to get rid of. Yeah. So they're sitting in the tacos uh, glove yeah, box yeah. right now. I our our special guest from a uh, week before last. Yeah. Uh, left his sunglasses here. We will get them returned. Yeah. 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 They're, they're not pit vipers though. They're not pit vipers. Very disappointed. You want some of these sweet PVs? I know you do. <laughs> Everybody wants a, everybody wants a t-shirt from the Teesprings channel. You know? Oh yeah, we gotta let's uh yeah, yeah let's promote the t-shirts before we go. Yeah, let's promote the t-shirts. I'm hungry. Bear we've with had, us as we promote our gospel t-shirts. I, I'm one. actually gonna order when we get done with dinner, I'm gonna order another one. Oh yeah? yeah, yeah, we gotta get another one. Maybe do a different saying on it. I don't know. But uh yeah, I can't hack a typewriter. Can't Every time the bell rings, the devil's laptop dies. We've got all kinds of sayings on there. We might upload a couple new ones too. We've got like two dozen different 
uh, quotes. David's so. like, please stop flexing right now. You are embarrassing yourself. Uh, yeah, it's potato cam after party. Yeah. Only the only the <laughs> only ones that love us and get us watch this part of the show. Anyway, so <laughs> right? Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see. We love. Oh, Adam Barrel says I would love a signed copy of Wayfarers. You know, what, Adam, I need to send you. I need to send you a bunch of stuff. I need to like basically. It's going to cost like a hundred and fifty dollars, but it's going to be so worth it because yeah. we have like so much stuff that we've been meaning yeah. to send you. And yeah. I, I apologize. We got to get him some T-shirts and uh, some swag. Yep, and um, we've been talking about a couple of other things, at least one other thing special that we wanted to do for you, Adam. Yep. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, we have like totally yep. dragged we can't ass on that. Say. We can't talk about it though; it's a surprise. It's really cool. Yep. I will. I'll, I'll make sure you get some sweet PVs in that package. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. So awesome. Well, I think that's it, man. I don't have anything else. Do you? No, I'm I am hungry, and, uh, and I'm not cranky yet, but I'm getting there. Getting so, there. Yeah. <laughs> A little right loopy. on. Anyways, uh, yeah. So I'm Jonathan. I'm Nick, and we are the Goslings. And uh, we hope everybody enjoyed it. We'll see you guys next week. Adam, Dave, everybody, we love you. Daniel, thank you for stopping yes, by. Thank you for watching, Daniel. I hope you enjoyed the interview with Dr. Pole. Yeah, Dr. Pole is killer. So yeah. typewriter revolution, baby. Yep. And then get Kevin you the some. realms. Get yep. you that book on TarsNecros.com. And the timepiece. What's and up? If you got kids, piece. this is the book yeah. for them. You got some little kids. You want them to read something cool. You got a teenager who's like, oh, I don't like Christianity. It's too like soft or whatever. Yeah, Heavenly Realms, Imperium Fall. Oh yeah, lots of violence. Super cool. Blood, guts, so, gore, violence, yeah. angel style. Angels. Yeah, man. <laughs> All right, guys. We'll catch you next time. All right. See you, everyone. Bye. Bye. <laughs> it won't. You. It won't turn off. You put these you pit put vipers on. on. I'll tell you, you put these pit vipers on, oh, dude. Yeah. Like, there's Let's no, do this. Let's do this. there's no way.